Talk about it all here on the Jordy Colada Show. Make sure and hit that like button, share button, comment button. You know, one thing about Jaden that I've tried to talk to him about is tightening his chin strap. Because he doesn't tighten it. So every time he gets hit, it looks like his helmet's all messed up. And it's like, oh, God, he just got rocked. For the win! Good! It's good! LSU does it! After a fucking Saturday night in Tiger Stadium, boys! <laughs> Are you kidding me? Well, uh, LSU fan came stuck his spike in my boot. <laughs> that ball was the heart. Fan brought his two grandkids by and literally was just 30 seconds. Just wanted to say thank you for the team and the season and what you did and, and how much it means to everybody here is, is truly what makes LSU special. Yeah. Kelly, we're official. Finally, I'm getting a chance to meet you. Thought I have to get a private audience with the Pope. There's just there's Jordy. Money through Friday from seven to nine. Yeah, you see the notification. We about to go live. We got all your favorite guests. We got them in line. It's the Jordy Collider Show. And Come have a good time. Clearing up, answering the question. I thought, my God, if she gets offered this job, she's gonna take it. It's just a crazy, fun time at LSU right now. Isn't this what everybody loves? From the boot to the east to the west coast. No matter where we get, we're gonna the show. Open up the phone lines. Come and join the show. Make sure you tell your friends about Jordy Collider Show. Yeah. Let's go. Big day. Nice start. It's the Jordan Collider Show. Come Welcome in to a Wednesday edition of the Jordy Colada Show live here from our Click Here Digital Studios on this Wednesday morning. Good to start the day here with you. We appreciate you starting here with us. Make sure and hit that like button, share button, comment button as we will be here with you until after 8 o'clock this morning. We'll talk to Wilson Alexander who covers LSU football for The Advocate and NOLA.com as Tigers back on the practice field yesterday morning. Joe Sloan was speaking with the media. We've got Sloan cut up for uh, some sound bites that will let you hear from uh, the offensive coordinator as he was, as he was speaking uh, post-practice yesterday. Tons to get to. And remember, Daily, we're brought to you by our friends over at RMB Builders. Rhett Bourgeois and his crew builds us every single day. Custom design homes. If you need any handiwork done around the house, if you're doing some remodeling work, whether it's in the office or at the house, residentially and commercial. Uh, licensed is Rhett Bourgeois. RMB-Builders.com is where you find him. And then uh, on social media, you can hit him at RMB Builders. Great Instagram page uh, daily. Our phone line is brought to you by our friends over at Southern Regional Medical Center. Charlie Harvey, Jason Ramazan, and the entire crew over there. We always appreciate and love those guys. Find them on Facebook uh, over at Southern Regional Medical Center. And remember, Mr. Fun's Travel is already putting the trip together to, uh, uh, to Vegas uh, for LSU-USC. So if you're ready to start planning that trip, uh, and you need tickets, air accommodation, hotel accommodation, travel to and from the game, 
Uh, get online at MrFunsTravel.com. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll still. Uh, we'll Look, see. We'll see. Big plans. It, I got. I, we got. We got. We got a, a, a ultimate plan. Then we got you know some fallbacks. Contingency fallbacks. plan. Right. 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 We're still trying and shooting for the big plan here, boys. Uh, if the big plan comes through, uh, buckle up. Uh, all right, so uh, as we said, RMB. No, we'll, we'll, we'll jump on a plane for that one. We'll, we'll get back on a plane. Uh, I'll put my hat back on. I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm all right. God, still have legs. some. Still have some nightmares from that flight, though. The best thing is that you were alone in there. Just I guess oh it's just me. God, I talked to the pilot yesterday. It's just gonna be me and you. It's just That's me. right. It's just me. I mean, it was. Who was thought? Be. That's what I told him. It was supposed to be like this. We dropped everybody else off. I mean, it was destiny. I mean, I really hate flying. I mean, Captain it's just, going down yeah, with the right. ship. It's supposed to go oh, down Captain like we're over the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> not gonna find us. Yeah. It's over. I like, mean, you know, right over you Roswell. Know, if you can put this thing down. We're spending the night out here, bro. We're shark bait. Oh my god, it's over. I mean, ugh. How do you shoot um, a flare gun? <laughs> all right, so I'm a little confused on this Malky and LSU women's basketball stuff. Is she is she MAGA or is she liberal? Because two days ago, she was Trump's vice president nominee. And then today, she's leading the liberal news on, on social media. I don't get it, right? And just with a little bit of homework here, I mean, it really doesn't take a lot of effort. And for the people out there that are, that are gas bagging this, this topic on <laughs> the national anthem in LSU, I mean, it, it is... I can't remember a team locally that has trolled and has gotten under the skin of mainstream media the way that this LSU women's team has. And it's led by Kim Mulkey. I mean, if you listen to the pushback, the feedback, the criticism, the compliments, whatever it is on this team, it always starts with the coach. I mean, they've got some polarizing figures and faces and names on this roster with Angel Reese and Flaugé and Haley Van Lith and Michaela Williams. I mean, you've got big brands on this team and Mulkey leads the charge every time when, you know, the feedback, the pushback, the announcements. I, I felt almost sorry for our governor yesterday, right? I mean, like have a little, just a, a tad bit of aware. You want to fight this fight on a Tuesday? I mean, like, you want to put this, when all you got to do is just ask around, like, hey, what's the deal on the, the anthem thing? Yeah, well, they've been going in for, for two and a half years now. I have been, been on the floor for an anthem in over, over two years, Gov. Like, let's get back to policy and working and whatever you're trying to do down in New Orleans or clean up the state. You know, fix the roads. Fix the crime. Worry about what's going on with the one of the most popular teams that the state has. You want to go after them? I mean, like, really, who on your team was like, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's put it out on social media. I mean, I, t I expect it from Clay Travis. I expect it from Dan Levitard. But the governor to throw his hat in? It really proves just the unawareness. I mean, like, Gov, a little bit of research. I mean, just call somebody on the team who is a season ticket holder. Got to be one. Hey, what's the deal on this women? Yeah, well, Gov, they had been they had been out for the anthem for two, you know two years now. What's the story on that? I don't know. Uh, you got a direct line to her though. You should call her or call her boss. I mean, let's not put the social media statement out right now. I mean, it's just, it's Tuesday, April 2nd. We, we, like, what do you want to fight this fight for? You just got in office. You pick a fight with her? She just bullied the whole legislative body into $100 million. I mean, so is she MAGA? Is she, is she, is she Trump's vice president nominee? Or, or is she leading the liberal wire? I, I don't get it. Make up your mind. Because 48 hours ago, she was all MAGA, right? The whole world was against her because she was homophobic, they said. But now she's leading liberal news because her team wasn't on the floor for the national anthem. 
Neither was USC or UConn, by the way, in the game that followed LSU and Iowa. I know Iowa's arm in arm out on, on the floor and a solid show of patriotism. But because LSU wasn't on the floor and hasn't been for over two years, does it make them commies? And it's not a story today if it wasn't a story a year and a half ago. And why is it a story in the USC UConn game? Really? Is it the fact that this team of is just that polarizing? Okay, well, I mean, you know what? If you're going to be the heel, be the heel. Wear it. Be the villain. You want to hate and troll America on this stuff and the mainstream media? Fine. It's almost laughable. This is laughable. I mean, if you have not seen and gotten a front row seat to the instability of media over the last 48 hours. If you need an example, it has been the LSU women's basketball team. Two days ago, three days ago, we were talking about a Washington Post article and and an LA Times article that had polarized and politicized the team and the coach as far right wingers and Trump supporters And two days later, they're all over social media's liberal news because they didn't stand for the, I don't get it. Which way are we going? Where where is it? That's all I'm asking is just a little bit of consistency. Or can we go back to just keeping sports sports? Thank you. Right? Like why now do the sports conversation have to be polluted by politics? That's why I came to sports. That's why I really started watching sports, love sports, is because you had all different types of backgrounds. Nobody nobody cared where people came from. Can they make a play? Can they help us win? Put them in the game. Who cares where they're from, how they vote, who they are, what color they are, what they're from, who who they sleep with. I don't care. Can they help us win? Put them in. Other than that, I don't care. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm at sports. That's what I'm I'm getting away from all that stuff. Now my sports is polluted with politics. I can't even cheer for a team because you don't even know Which way, I mean, two days ago, you had me believing that Trump was going to announce Kim Mulkey as his vice president nominee. Now, I'm supposed to believe that she hates America? Man, you know what? I'm just, I'm going to sit back and laugh at this and just keep my sports, my sports, as long as I can do that. I don't know how long before it's just shoved down your throat and in your face that you're not going to be able to watch it without the politics and which way people lean, vote, pledge, donate money. I could give a damn, man. Give me the game. I mean, she's won four national titles. She's a good coach. Awesome. How she's done it, I Is she still doing it 35 years later? She must have had a lot of success. I don't need to know the backstory and who she pissed off and why she's not talking to her dad anymore. I just need my sports, my sports. I mean, what it has become, the governor. I mean, governor. Who is on your team that told you to put that out? Fire them today. Really. And truly, why in the hell would you fight that fight on a Tuesday when this state is crumbling? You got people leaving and fleeing, going to Houston, Dallas to make them better markets. And we're worried about losing brain power. And the top of the chain is putting out a tweet like that on a Tuesday at the beginning of April. When the traffic's getting worse, the crime's getting worse, the education's pitiful, and you're going after one of the only success stories that the state has to celebrate? Without just a little bit of, all you had to do is just pick up the phone. There's no way I'd believe that you don't have a season ticket holder for the LSU women's basketball program 
on staff that you can't text and say, give me the backstory on the, on, on the anthem. Why aren't they out there? Well, Gov, I've been going to every game now for over a year and a half, and I've never seen them out there. Oh, really? So this isn't anything new? No. So you definitely shouldn't tweet anything about it today, because if you do, you're going to show that you haven't really paid attention to one of the biggest success stories that the state's had over the last three years. I wouldn't do it. I mean, you know, like you're going you're gonna to piss some people off by doing that. You're the governor. Why would you want to fight that fight? Why would you want to show that you hadn't been watching the team that's been bringing the state a lot of notoriety? Why, 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 why would you want to prove that? And then we're supposed to celebrate it? Where are we, man? Where, where are we? That, that sports is now politics? I'm out on that. You're not going to get that on this show. I'm not. You're not going to ever know where I'm leaning, where, where my politics are, because it's, 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 not, it's not for here. That's not why you came here. We came, we came here to talk sports. We're going to try to keep it about sports, even though all the sports is being politicized now. Is there anything worse than when it bleeds over? No. Because then you just can't. That's why, like, I'm with you. This is why I came to this arena. It's to get away from all of that. Like, I couldn't give two hoots about politics. And they always, somehow, there's always a national story or some sort of story that bleeds over into patriotism and sports. They're two separate things. One's sports, one's politics. Now, if you're, what's funny is they're almost exactly the same thing. People that are diehard about their sports also can be diehard about politics. Like, it seems like you'd like to pick one. But the conversations always kind of run themselves in a circle, and the people that are passionate about sports argue with the same vigor that people would, that want to politicize things argue with. Like the governor, like Jeff Landry, is now he's telling universities to put a policy in place that requires their athletes to attend the national anthem or risk losing their scholarships. Like I don't think you can do that, but go off, King. Like yeah. It's so uh, Charles County matters. Charles County matters. Jordy, you've had interaction with politicians on the show. We have. We have. We've kept it a lot about sports, but we've also recognized our platform and used it as a place for people to send a message. And some of those, full disclosure, have been paid ads, paid spots for people to be on this show. I mean, that's how we make a living is off of advertisement and selling that. So I'm not going to hide behind it. And if somebody wants to buy advertisement on this show, they can without question have a seat. And this has, I've always said, open to any and everybody who wants to talk sports. If there's a sports angle to it, you've got a place here. And the people that we've brought through here that have outside interest, that we've been interested in hearing about, some have been politicians, but it's not necessarily how and where we voted, how we leaned, or if it was, we didn't tell you so. You know, like, we're doing this, so you have to. Was it a, a you know an endorsement from us? So you know, I mean, I I I appreciate your your interaction. Um, so I mean, you know, look, I, I just think, and, and again, like I said, we're not going to talk about it, and, and we're not going to make this show about politics. I just thought it was very unaware yesterday, and, and I thought again, like, what? So what's the deal on Mulkey the the program? Is it is it which side is it? I, I don't get it. If if you're gonna politicize it and you're gonna make it about it, make up your mind, because I mean it's it, it's it's hard to keep up at this point, right? Remember our friends over at Barker Brothers Plumbing and Works. Barker Brothers Plumbing and Works with a couple of locations. Uh, over in Plaquemine that you can get in touch with directly, Jude Barker and his crew, just by calling 225-776-2431. You mentioned the show, you save 15% on any service that you get from Barker Brothers Plumbing and Works. That's commercial and residential plumbing. Uh, trusted Jude Barker, great name within plumbing circles, wherever you are, uh, whether we say commercial or residential, a couple of trucks, East Baton Rouge Parish, uh, every single day. Uh, you can find him there at Barker Brothers Plumbing and Works. Uh, Mark Cumby asked, Jordy, when's Mulkey coming on? In fact, we were texting with her uh, this morning asking uh, to, uh, to reserve some time. And she's going to get through this week. There's a big day, big announcement today. You'll find out uh, about Angel Reese and Haley Van Lith. And 
uh, you know, anybody else who, who has uh, a decision to make on, on what the next steps will be uh, for, for uh, them in, in uh, purple and gold at LSU. Uh, and obviously, I think you want to just kind of decompress a little bit this week, maybe exhale uh, from the season, and, and we'll link back up and, and have her back through um, next week. So, uh, you know, we'll find out today. I, I don't think that the coach knows. Um, and, you know, I think she's kind of waiting to hear just like we all are. Right. I mean, there's been some conversation, but I don't think that there's anything that's been definitively said, you know, one way or another um, that that she knows going into the decision. Um, I will say this. If that is the case, remember what Frank Wilson told us on this show a couple of years ago. I think it was last year going into the season. He said, look, if if they get to the if they get to the announcement and you're 24 hours out from the announcement and and you don't know you're probably not the guy. You're probably not the choice. Um, or not take, take the probably out of that statement. You're not the choice. Um, I don't necessarily know in a situation like this, this is very different. This is an outlying situation, right? I, I think that um, Angel Reese, for the most part, knows where she fits in on the team, right? I mean, it's not like you're going to go to the coach and be like, look, if I come back, what's the deal? Like, if you come back, we're going to build the whole thing around you again. You know, I mean, like you're going to be the you're going to be the centerpiece. Um, I, I don't think she has to be told that. Right. I mean, it wasn't like Shaq had to be told that his junior season to come back. I mean, it was very well understood. Like, you know, Diesel, you come back. I mean, here's the keys. You know, like the whole thing's yours. Um, yesterday, I was I, I was I, I was saying that I, I believe she comes back today. I, I You know, it's. Fluid situation. I mean, it's either way. I I don't know, man. I, I I don't know how to really feel, you know, one way or the other. Like we said, I think the money is a topic, and the NIL and the money travels. Whether she goes to the WNBA, whether she stays in college basketball, Angel Reese is going to make a lot. Uh, she's going to make a really good living. Um, you know, it's probably going to if it, if there's a difference to it, it might be a couple of you know, tens of thousands of dollars. And, and to a lot of people, that's a lot of money. But in this scenario, it's not something that I think would make you say, all right, let's go. Because, you know, we'll get an extra 50000 if if we go to the WNBA. Um, so I, I think that the money, for the most part, is kind of a wash, right? Like, I mean, like, you kind of, like, look at it and say, yeah, I mean, if you go, you get money. You stay, you get paid. So it comes down to the basketball part, right? I mean, I mean, I'm sure that there's some off the court stuff that you look at with a, with with, with a you know, uh, a character and a personality and someone that that has that type of push and you know, steam behind her. But you know, for the most part, I mean, it really I think comes down to the basketball. And I think if you're Angel Reese, you look at a situation where you say, I mean. If I left today, and if Angel leaves today, I really believe that she's an all-time great at LSU. Like, when it's, when it's all said and done, when you have a chance to kind of like step away from it, look at what she's accomplished over the two years that she's been here in Baton Rouge. I mean, she's the SEC Player of the Year. She's won a national championship. She is an All-American. I'm trying to find, there was, a, there was a social media post that came up the other day that had all of her accomplishments, and I just want to make sure that I don't leave anything out. But as far as decorated, and as far as you know, a player that comes in and leaves behind a, a legacy, I'm not sure if there's any more that Angel Reese could do. Um, you know, I mean, just from what she's accomplished, in the, in the time that she's been in, in college basketball. I mean, I'm sure while she was at Maryland, there are some things that, that she's accomplished that she's very proud of. Um, but, you know, I mean, you talk about winning a national championship and, and really, you know, being the leader of Kim Mulkey's, you know, first push of creating success as LSU women's basketball coach 
when you think of the early days of, of Mulkey's reign here in Baton Rouge, you know, a lot of the faces that you'll see, a lot of it'll be built around Reese, right? It, and then that, that's if she leaves today, right? I mean, everything that she's accomplished, All-American, SEC Player of the Year, Defensive Player of the Year, National Championship, Elite Eight this season. I'm sure she'll be a in, unanimous All-American this season. Yeah, she was just named to the Wooden Award All-American team. So, I mean, that you know, if she leaves today, I think if you hang Sylvia and Simone's accomplishments in the rafters and numbers in the rafters, I think you got to make room for number 10 at some point. If she came back, she could she could live in a planet that, you know, she's flirting with now that only a handful of Simone Augustus, Tyron Matthew, Joe Burrow, Billy Cannon, Kevin Falk, Glenn Dorsey break through to, right? Where it's just, they'll never pay for anything in Louisiana ever again. You know, outside of like, you know, real estate and businesses. But I mean, as far as like meals and hotel room and comps, I mean, like those, they, they, they live on another planet. And I think Reese could come back and, I mean, be a legitimate all timer. I mean, you know, if like she a, isn't already. Right, right. I and mean, I believe we, she is. Right. I mean, like, I believe she lives on a, on a stratosphere that very few do from LSU athletics, right? I still think that they're going to retire a jersey at some point. I still think that, you know, she'll be always celebrated in Baton Rouge, and we were very lucky to watch her over the last two years. What I love about Reese and what I was telling, you know, like Lil' Jay and his, his buddies about when you watch her play, you got to love and respect the way she competes. You know, I guess when we were, and, and, and you know, I mean, I hate to be the old guy here, but I mean, just when we were coming up, that's what competition was. Like, people hated each other. You know what I mean? Like, for the most part, the Pistons hated the Bulls. You know what I mean? Like, the Saints hated the 49ers. That, that's, that was the age, kind of, that was the, that, that's what really kind of sports was to me was, you know, like, heated dis. Just, you know, just dis despising the person against you. You know, we came up in a generation where boxing was still a little, it was still prominent, right? Where you still had Tyson versus Holyfield, Tyson versus Spinks. I, I don't know, pick one. But, you know, I mean, you still had that type of one-on-one -on -one type of almost primal type of competitive spirit to it. Reese has that. Reese has the, you know, I mean, after she got one of those, and it's not just about the antics and the emotion. I mean, a lot of, a lot of players have that, but where she gets it and where it comes from, you can see is just so genuine. I mean, I thought that shot of her the other night that the ESPN ABC cameras caught when she was walking off the, the court and she told Malky into, you know, not disrespectfully, but I mean, just in a competitive, like, get me the effing ball. And, and, you know, she was right. And it's not just about that. It's just about the way that she wills the team and competes for, for, for the entire game. I just, she has, without question, got my respect from a competitive standpoint, which is, you know, how we were introduced to Angel Reese. Right? I mean, you just got to know her and watching her play basketball. Throughout watching her for two years, you've grown to know her personality and, you know, you feel how you feel about her. I love her. I think she's great. I think she's great for the game. I think she's great for LSU. She represents the brand great. I mean, she's the first, in my opinion, she's the first real case study of NIL. Right? Like the first real NIL athlete that LSU has had. Stop me if I'm wrong, but I'm just trying to think this thing out loud and I'm thinking on my feet here of the last three years 
of the 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 amount of talent, the the, the Dylan Cruz, the Jaden Daniels, the Angel Reese that has come through here, Reese was the one that really felt like she capitalized on NIL more than any of them. And I'm sure they all did well, right? I mean, I'm sure they all left college with a lot more money than they showed up with. But Reese was a real NIL commodity in between her sophomore and junior season in college at LSU. Whether it was in the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue or whether it was just being on Team USA or a part of that. She was always around the discussion of college basketball and how one player could make money off of it, and she made a lot of money. But she's also a study of, can it work? Because if you rewind the tape, and we were in this exact day last season, you know, the weekend before Angel Reese's life changed, right? I think we all knew kind of going up to this weekend that there were going to be a, something different happen, right? Either, you know, either way, either you win it or you lose it and somebody was going to be at the center. Angel Reese was the MVP of the game. She was the one that made the big plays. LSU won the game. She got caught with the celebration on national television. I mean, she was the one where her brand just exploded. I would really argue for the the weeks and maybe a month or six weeks after that game, you could argue that Angel Reese was the most the most popular athlete on the planet. Like there wasn't anybody on any social media feed that didn't see, hear, know about Angel Reese. They did a Saturday Night Live skit on Angel Reese. Okay. That's pretty, you know, you're you're into pop culture if they're doing Saturday Night Live skits about you. You're in the mainstream. People are talking about you. People know about you. There's no way I would have been able to handle that for a second year. There's no way. If I was 19, 20, in between the window of 18 and 21, she's the first case study that got pretty much all the money and handled it. Well, she was suspended for two games. Okay. I mean, like... All right, I expected. Like, I remember, remember when all that stuff was happening? Weren't we all like, well, you knew this was going to happen. Right. I mean, you, you know, at some point, you give her all this money, you give her all this freedom, you give her all this, 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 this slack and attention. She's going to, she's too young to handle it. Bullshit. I mean, like, she spun that story on its face and put LSU on her back with her wallet fat and carried him to a, a couple of plays away from a Final Four again. I mean, to me, she's a great case study of, can they handle it? What happens when we do give them the millions? I don't know. You can look at Angel Reese. She had her team a, a possession or two away. I mean, she fouled out with five minutes left on a charge that was bang, bang. You know, I mean, if she's on the floor for the last four minutes of the game, who knows what happens? But one thing's for sure is that she handled her business while her bank account was growing. And that was one NIL concern that I always had going in. What happens when you start paying them? Like what happens when they're, you know, when they, when, when they, you know, she pulls up to practice in a Mercedes. And she's got an NIL deal with Amazon. <laughs> I mean, like, what do you do? What do you do? She's still going to get you a double-double? Every night she got you a double-double. Every night. She's a walking double-double. I mean, to me, I know I was proven wrong, not just on the Angel Reese story, but just on the, are they going to be able to hang and, and, and compete at that level when they, get, when they get the money? Well, Angel Reese did. That's for certain. And I think in an early period of NIL, there's got to be case studies happening, right? You got to be like looking at like all types of studies once the the landscape and environment has changed so so drastically like it has with NIL. Angel Reese is a, is a success story in it. Whether she comes back or not. I mean, she's proven she can handle it. 
So if her bank account grows by $2 million next year, I'm not worried about whether or not she's going to go out and get me a double-double. I mean, she was the best player on the floor on Saturday. I, on, on, you know, on, on, on the UCLA floor. You know, I mean, outside of Caitlin Clark going Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese was Angel Reese. So, selfishly, I hope she comes back. I have no idea whether she will or she will. And that's the the decision she has to make, right? All the things that you just said are why you would wonder why she wouldn't come back. If she wants all of, if she wants to continue to be probably the most polarizing person in women's basketball at the moment, like when you put in personality and game and all of the things that come with it, like it, that would probably happen more at the collegiate level than it would at the WNBA level. And the money is going to be the money. Like I think the somebody said in the chat that the CBA goes up for the WNBA, but they only make... I say only in quotes, but what two hundred fifty thousand dollars is probably like the cap of what you get paid in the WNBA. Well, I don't, do, do, That's like the it, highest paid player. Is it? I, I yeah. Mean, I thought Candace Parker said she made like ninety thousand bucks. I, yeah, th- from what I've seen, that I think Donna Taurasi signed for like, and this is a Donna Taurasi kind of the probably at the back end of her career, but I think she makes two hundred and thirty, if I'm not mistaken. But you would think that. If you, I mean, that's a good amount of money to make just, just for playing basketball. Sure. You don't have to deal with school. You don't have to deal with being Angel Reese at LSU, which I'd imagine every day is something. If you go to the WNBA, some of that attention kind of goes away. And I don't know if she would rather that or rather come back and be the absolute, like the zenith of the sport where everything that she, do, that she would do in college would be under a magnifying glass. If she wants that, then she would. Then I would imagine you would come back if she's ready to move on and go to the WNBA and kind of not have the pressure of being Angel Reese every single day. Then that has its benefits too. Highest paid salary in the WNBA is two hundred and forty one thousand yeah. nine hundred eighty four dollars. And so I don't know how what the rookie scale is for the WNBA, but and maybe this is the WNBA. We talked about this a little bit yesterday, where they want Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark both to go to the WNBA and be like, okay, this is who's going to champion our sport now, because they had. What the most viewed college basketball over the most viewed uh, tournament game in women's history was on Monday night with 12 yeah. million people watching. One million people watched the WNBA finals. Like that's what you're. Oh, they, gosh. Yeah, they outdrew every NBA game last season except Game Five of the finals. Every college football game last season outside of the college football playoff, Ohio State, Michigan, and the SEC championship. Wow. And every MLB game last season. So that's what you're walking away from. And I don't know if, if that – like, I don't know what appeal the WNBA really has if you either. want the – because it could just be her, really. Like, there's going to be other stars that come out of college basketball, but Angel Reese would live on a planet by herself if she came back and Caitlin Clark was in the WNBA. I mean, don't they fly commercial? Who? Oh, LSU? yeah. WNBA. Yeah. No, oh, WNBA. Hell no, LSU doesn't. Uh, uh, I don't, you I don't think know Kim what, Mulkey's flying commercial? On Gordon's jet. I don't, I mean, I don't like, know what – WNBA does. I could. I'd imagine they fly commercial. Yeah, I'm, I'm almost certain that they do. It's I'm saying you're almost taking a kind of you're changing your lifestyle for certain. And I don't know if she thinks that maybe if she goes to the WNBA, like she can help yes. pioneer the sport. They fly a commercial. Yes. They, I mean, you know, primarily fly a commercial. Yeah, it's, it's almost when your like, flight from Nashville to Detroit. You'll be sitting next to Angel next season. <laughs> Go tell her that today. <laughs> right. You know, like I mean, hey Angel, how you doing? <laughs> Two o'clock on a Tuesday. You're gonna go sit next to some mouth breather and want to know why you didn't box out Caitlin Clark last year? Well, I didn't put you on Caitlin Clark. <laughs> I've been meaning to ask you, old angel. <laughs> what y'all do during that when <laughs> what happened at Elite Eight game? And why were y'all not out during that national? Yeah, uh, well, you national stand anthem. for the anthem on this plane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, what y'all doing in that locker room? <laughs> All right, remember daily we're brought to you by Go Roof online at GEAUX roof.com. Go Roof Daily, res, uh, whether it's residential or commercial roofing needs. They got you taken care of over at Go Roof. Get in touch with them 225 927 8300. 225 927 8300 is the phone number that you can get in touch with Go Roof. A beautiful roof every single time. Remember, they are all over South Louisiana. So if you're a new listener, whether you're on the North Shore, if you are over in New Orleans and you need a trusted roofer, uh, give Go Roof a chance today. Call them 225 927 8300 or online geauxroof.com. Geauxroof.com. Uh, roof's up with our friends. Over at Go Roof. Stewie was out at practice yesterday. We're going to talk to Wilson Alexander coming up here at 815 
Uh, Wilson needed to move from his Tuesday segment because of yesterday's practice. Tigers back on the practice field tomorrow, so Sturry will be out there uh, covering practice once again. See anything? Stewie, I thought Joe Sloan was, was interesting in, in a couple of his sound bites. We'll hear from him, but uh, anything you see? Mm, QB2 race is on. Ah. QB2 race is on. Seems like he likes Ricky, Ricky Yeah, Collins. Ricky's been mm-hmm. the last couple of times, and Swan's been with the third team, so it seems like Ricky has taken over the QB2 race. And I mean, besides that, it's just drills. Like, it's the same 20 minutes we get every time unless we get the full practice, which we haven't which will get Saturday, but I won't be there. But it's, I mean, like I said, it's just, it's the usual suspects. Like, for uh-huh. me, I go I go watch the defense. D-line's still a little bit thin. Demarion Johnson missed practice yesterday. I don't know why. I saw him before leaving the facility. Emory Jones back running with the ones? Yeah, Emory Jones is back with the team. Uh, the guy that everybody is talking about is Tyree Adams. Like really? behind Will and Emery, like that's the next, Left that's tackle. the next man up, yeah. And so DJ Chester coming in and he's going to play. I'd imagine be your center. Yeah, coming that's, in because Sloan talked about him a good bit yesterday mm-hmm. when he's coming into a new position. Like I say, it's hard to play center, but Chester got wow. kind of thrown into the fire last year whenever you needed him, and you really couldn't tell the difference. So I think that that's a that's a strength going forward. I'm interested to see what they do with the portal because, like you said, yeah. the defensive line continues to be thin, and it's, it's not like you can do anything about that now. But could you say there's any tangible difference between watching the defense last year and this year? Hmm. Yeah, a lot, a, a lot of difference. It's you could tell the how much the players are in tune with the coaches, more like engaged, more engaged. Like they ask questions, the coaches kind of coach them up when they know they need coaching points. Like it, it's. It's very refreshing to see, for sure. They said that Baker and Perkins are tied at the hip. Yes, like every like every linebacker drill, you can tell he emphasizes Perkins doing everything right, like all the little things they were working on, shooting the hands yesterday and getting through blocks. And Perk went a couple times just so he could get it right. How is um, Greg Penn? Greg Penn looks Greg Penn reliable. Just, you know, a senior, been here a while, knows how it works, knows how college works. Seems like he's teaching the young guys how to practice, how to, you know. Because they got a lot of rookies out there. Yeah, right? they got a lot of, like, especially in the linebacker room. Right. So, he, it, Greg Penn's the leader of the room. Like, he's the leader of the pack. He's always first in every drill. He does everything right. Blake Baker's always giving him a good compliment at the end of it. Like, good, Greg. You know, like, so you know what you get from Greg Penn. Uh, any questions here in the chat? Obviously, one's about defensive line. Uh, defensive line just very thin right now, right? Very, very thin. I mean, what you got is what you got. Like what you see is what you get. I, I'm kind of interested to see what they what Chemo does the, uh, the offensive, offensive lineman, lineman turn defensive lineman just because have to play right. He's gonna right. He's gonna have to play one and then like just the I, I don't know. He just seems like a guy that would be able to do that. I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense because I have not seen him really play, but I just he just seems like somebody that you know he's been at LSU for a while, probably itching to get on the field somehow, and now he gets a chance to play defensive line, and he he doesn't look like a slouch, you know. He played both in high school, right? So is Geo here yet from Wisconsin? When does he get on campus? The defensive uh, lineman that they added. Question. I would think it probably summertime. I don't think he could like yeah. enter. He's probably got to close. This, he's got to probably got to close the semester. Mm-hmm. Um, they've had some recruits at practice. Yes, right. Uh, is there Jabari An- Antoine was there. Jabari Antoine and uh, cornerback. I I, I I do not know how to pronounce his name. But Onus. He, yeah, he yeah. he was there. Seems like Jabari. Conan Banny. Yeah, it seems like Jabari is recruiting him to you know. I think he's from South Carolina. Make his commitment. Uh, somebody's asking about the Weeks brothers. The Re- Weeks brothers are your second team linebackers. Like, that's that's the next group up. I, they look good. They don't look. I mean, you know what mm-hmm. you get from them too. So it's Penn, Perk, and who would be the third backer? Are they just running two? It's two, and then they have the Weeks, the start, the star position, which is major. Oh, Burns. major Burns walked down. Yeah, and then they put Sage at safety. I saw that he was. Mm-hmm. On social media, they had a little pick six of Sage. Which that was, that he's was, had a really good that camp, was, yeah. huh? Yeah, that was spring. I mean, no, Saturday. That was the, the, yeah, the Saturday practice they were that we outside. got to watch. But, I mean, yeah, Sage, Sage looks comfortable. He looks like he's playing the position that he was recruited to play. Yeah. Finally. Yeah, yeah. finally. Right. 
Um, and then some of the youngsters, right? P.J. Woodland's having a standout camp. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you could tell Corey Raymond, like, he, he, he loves he loves P.J. Woodland, but he's coaching him hard to where he's yeah. he's showing him, you know, like this is the standard, and you, you keep the standard every day. But, yeah, P.J. Woodland's won. Uh, in the safety room, you got Deshaun McBride, Kylan Jackson, uh, Jordan Allen. Like they, the safety room is the, is the room I'm. Yeah, I'm really interested to see what they do, just because you have Jordan Gilbert and Sage, but you also have some young guys that you could probably work in during, like just during the season, just yeah. because of how much talent you have in the room. Uh, all right, Joe Sloan was speaking with the media on uh, on Tuesday. Uh, here is Coach Sloan's opening statement yesterday. As we'll just roll down the list here, Stewie, because a lot of good, uh, good tidbits and sound bites here from Joe Sloan, new offensive coordinator alongside Cortez Hankton. Uh, here is Sloan uh, introducing himself yesterday to the media. Just seeing a lot of growth, right? I think you know the big thing coming into this offseason was about developing our identity as an offense um, and really trying to start that from inside out. Right? Every, everything's got to start from inside out, from the offensive line out to the perimeter. Um, and we want to be known as a physical football team that's explosive on the perimeter. And I, I think as, you, as, as we watch throughout spring practice, a lot of those things have been showing up. Um, getting a little more multiple in the run game uh, co- compared to maybe how we were the last couple seasons, right, with uh, just some different personnel. Um, and I think our guys have really taken to it and been paying attention and trying to continue to get better and better and better. And I think we've seen the improvement. The big thing now for the next couple weeks will, will really be about our focus and attention to detail and kind of finalizing a little bit of who we are from a consistency standpoint, play to play. Um, and what we want to be known, you know, what we want to be known for, uh, just as we head into the uh, into this next little piece of the off season. But I'm excited about where we're all, where we are. I think, man, there's just been some guys. We have we have some really good leadership um, from some of our older guys. I mean, you look at uh, at Will and Emery, but really it goes across the across the O line. I think, um, you know, Delhi and Miles right now have been playing their best football, and uh, DJ really has. I think taking on the the vocal piece of center, um, which has been really nice to see. But got some younger guys too who are challenging those guys. Um, and then on the perimeter, you know, Kyron and Chris, just their familiarity with with what we do, kind of have led the way, um, especially from a just setting the tempo standpoint. Uh, those guys in Mason, but but again, a lot of the different pieces that we've added or some of the younger guys um, ha- have done a really nice job. And then you know, in the backfield, J- Josh Williams is just such a such a pro. Um, he's a pro in everything that he does. Uh, his consistency and stability. Obviously, we got some other young dynamic players um, as well. But but I think his consistency and stability just brings something to uh, to our offense. And and you see, that's what we need. We need we need our guys who are older and have played a lot of football. We need them to play their best football. Um, and I like how they've approached the spring, right? And then uh, and then us in his uh, in his new role and and how he's taking it. Um, Kind of taking it head on. Um, so, so many good things to talk about. Definitely need to make some improvements, right? We're not where we need to be, uh, but we're definitely not where we were. So, uh, a lot of good things up to this point. A uh, good opening statement there from Joe Sloan. Obviously, you can feel the security that an offensive line brings a play caller. I mean, what a great luxury to have in year one as the primary or, or as a, a play caller with LSU uh, of knowing that you've just got these mules in front of you that are going to be first-round picks and guys that are going to be pro prospects that are all along and littered across the line. But the most uh, you know, luxurious part about all of them is that they're veteran, the experience. I mean, they're smart. They've seen it. They've been there. You know, Outside of D.J. Chester, who played limited last year towards the, the back end of it, I mean, you've got guys like Garrett Dellinger, who's logged a ton <laughs> of snaps of, of college football. Will Campbell now is is a you know a savvy veteran along with Emory Jones uh even even Frazier you know I mean who's played some big time football at LSU now and shout out to Frazier because he's always been the one that you thought was going to be the the loose piece that was going to get his job sniped and I mean not only is that room deep and talented holding your position is difficult because you gotta you gotta bring it every day I mean they got guys behind you that if you slip I mean, if you give a little bit of ground, your job's in jeopardy. And I thought Frazier was was the one that they would kind of like try to filter out after last season, after the start, the Florida State game, and then the guy said the thing after the game where one of the linemen told him they were good, and they said it was Miles Frazier. And it it just seemed like at some point he was going to be the one that that was going to be the eye man out. But he held his own, and he's – 
He's held a starting position for what? Th- what is this? His third year yeah. starting? Third year. So I mean, I think if once he got past the the Emory Jones inside Lance Hurd outside mm-hmm. battle, he was kind of in the clear. In the clear, yep. I mean, that was what they wanted to happen. They wanted her to be the right tackle. They wanted Emory Jones to be the right guard. They wanted that to be their offensive line. And shout out to Miles Frazier. He 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 handled it, man. And he he held his job, which is a very difficult task to do. Um, you know, when you're talking about this LSU team. All right, adding Slade Nag uh, or excuse me, this is his relationship with uh, Cortez Hankton. Uh, co-offensive coordinator, of course, Hankton, uh, LSU's primary wide receivers coach in the wide receiver room, uh, you know, just pumping pros out and bringing pros in. Uh, here he is talking about the relationship with Hankton. Yeah, I think, well, I think we have an unbelievable offensive staff. Um, and, and Cortez, you know, everybody sees his development at, uh, at the receiver position um, with the way last year, you know, obviously that uh, Malik and BT play and right and, and how now they're going to go on and obviously be first round draft picks and, and kind of what they did from a development standpoint, as well as Kyron and, and Chris and the, and, the, and the growth that those guys have had. I think what people don't see is um, his ability to game plan, his ability to understand how to attack defenses in the passing game. Um, and, and he was doing a ton of that last year. You know, that, that's, that's, not, that's not anything new. Um, and I think then where, you know, just with, with our new roles and, and his growth and just tying back in as well more into the run game perimeter game, whether it be from an RPO standpoint or whatever that might be, um, and just his involvement there. We, we have an awesome working relationship. I knew Tez when he first got done playing in the uh, UFL, not this UFL, the old UFL, all right, and he came over. I was a GA at South Florida, and he came over. And he and I met. Um, he was he was trying to start to get into coaching. He and I met. We stayed in touch for a long time. Almost worked together a, a couple other times, and just our relationship together, I think, is a really good working relationship. We keep each other um, keep each other centered, right, and and play off each other really well. But there's a ton of respect there, um, and I couldn't be more excited about just uh, how things have gone up to this point, but but how things have gone over the last couple years um, with with our ability to work together. More from Sloan. Here he is, and that was a good soundbite talking about their worker, uh, the working relationship uh, with he and Cortez. But here he is uh, talking and speaking more uh, about uh, new offensive additions, including Slade Nagel, who I think is going to be a real key component here to the offensive staff and a nice addition. You know, I think, it, it, and Coach Kelly talked about this first when um, when he made the decision to uh, to hire myself and. and and Cortez and just in our elevator roles and talked about just really when we wanted to add a tight end coach in terms of somebody who had call plays before, somebody who understood how we put uh, all the things together from an offensive standpoint. I think what Slade did at Tulane for the last couple years uh, speaks for itself. I mean, they went to the Cotton Bowl, beat USC, right, and, and do it, did it running the football, did it a lot of different ways. Um, and I think he brings a ton of value um, to what we're doing and how we're trying to expand our offense um, and do, do some different things and a variety of things, I think, that match our, our current personnel and the personnel we'll, you know, we'll have in the future, right? That's what we always want to do. Uh, but his ability to do that, he's been a football coach a long, long time. Um, I've known him. Shoot, uh, since I first got in the state, um, he was at McNeese, I was at Louisiana Tech, and we were both recruiting down here and, and been uh, friends a long time. The relationship that we have, the honesty that we can have back and forth, um, and that he can have amongst our staff, right, with he and Cortez and myself and, and really everybody in the room. Uh, but he th- brings a huge value from a, I think, a development standpoint of the tight ends and just his coaching ability. But, but on top of that, his ability to help in terms of formate things and make sure we're attacking people the right way, especially when it comes to the run game. Good addition on Nagel, really, when you're talking about familiarity with the state, his ability to recruit, obviously his time as a play caller, uh, very organized. He comes from a family of coaches. His dad is a coach uh, who's on the Zachary staff with Coach Brewerton. I mean, he is, uh, I, I believe, one of the uh, really solid pickups by by Brian Kelly in, in the offseason and a key addition, I think, to the offensive staff, somebody who's going to really help out. Um, from just the offensive standpoint, especially with the, the the emphasis on running the football this year. I mean, you're talking about a guy who very much understands and is familiar with with run styles, splits, and um, you know, just effective running. Felt like the uh, perfect coach, perfect fit, yeah, right? Really like good fit. Everything that you were looking for, you're able to find in one guy. Where you wanted somebody that had play calling experience, and you had a position of need that you. I think there's going to be a lot of emphasis on the tight ends this year, and then you add somebody that has. 
not only been a play caller, been successful at it, and now you have another kind of guy that can focus all of his attention on a tight end room that should be booming this year. Yeah, here he is specifically talking about that tight end room. Yeah, I think, well, Mason Taylor is one of our best football players. Um, he's, he's an excellent football player. People know him, right? Uh, LSU fans know him uh, for the last two years and just his consistency and his ability to make plays. Um, and I think we want to find ways to get him the ball. And I think you could see Nuss uh, working, working his way or, you know, it, obviously we're going to go where the read takes us, uh, but putting him in positions where he potentially is a first, second, or, or third read where the ball maybe will find him a, a, a little bit more. Um, but I think, you know, just from a consistency standpoint and uh, an experience standpoint, he obviously brings a ton. Um, and I think he's one of the best tight ends in the country. And we want to definitely want to utilize him that way. But I think our other young tight ends, uh, when you look at, at Pimp and, and uh, Mac Markway, just how they've grown and how we're trying to grow the offense and use those guys more multiple. You know, when we first got here, um, that was a room that really had to be rebuilt. And Coach Kelly and Coach Dimbrock started that. And obviously they have a huge, you know, Coach Kelly has a huge history with, with tight ends um, and what he's done with them over several years. But we wanted to grow that room. And I think we're close, right? We're close to getting there. Um, and if, you know, when you guys had an opportunity to be out of practice a little bit, I think you can see um, just how we want to use those guys a little bit more just within the framework of what we do on offense. Sloan, great energy. Cool. From the young coach. You can see why he's a good recruiter. Um, Sounds so confident. We had a chance to talk to C.J. Daniels here. Very impressive. Daniels. Uh, transfer out of Liberty. Here was Sloan talking about some of the new faces in the wide receiver room, including C.J. One, C.J. just brings... He, he's, he's such a level of consistency. You can see the experience and how he plays. He's an extremely smart player, um, and he's physical, and he is strong through the catch. Um, I, I think he's going to be a huge piece for what we're doing in the fall and, and putting him in different positions where he can use his strengths. Um, so that we can attack this conference, right? And and I think when you look at obviously, right, we spoke about the returners a little bit, but CJ, the, the level of leadership that he's brought to the room and and consistent work habits, um, it, it's just been it's been really good to see. And, and the the challenging thing for him is he's learning, right? Some of these other guys who have been here, they know, right? They've they've run these plays multiple times. He's learning, so every day out there, um, he's learning and he's getting better. And as, as we've watched through spring, um, just our ability to say, hey, we need a big catch, we can go his way, um, and he continues to produce. Um, but I'm excited about what he brings, probably even more from a toughness standpoint, a leadership standpoint, and a consistency standpoint. Because um, that's something that's, that's critical, and that's if you want to win championships, right? Your, your guys have to play that way. Um, and he brings that level to us. So I, I can't wait to watch him this fall. But it's been fun to watch his growth within the offense. Um, and I think he'll have even a bigger August camp, you know, just as we finish out. It'll be fun to watch him these next two weeks. Uh, Zavion's explosive. I mean, you know, earlier in camp, we, we hand him a jet sweep, right? And he's able to just, you can just see he has such a, just a feel for, for space and holes. He's made some really big plays down the field. He's, he's, he's got a lot of speed. Um, but I think ultimately, right, trying to get him the ball in space and maybe create, create punt returns on offense, right? We want to create punt returns on offense. And we'll have the ability to do that with him and, and as well with Aaron. I think Aaron's played a, a, a really good football as well, um, you know, and Kyle Parker, different guys who have the ability to maybe work small areas. Um, but xavier has been a, a, just a, a treat to have here. And again, I speak to his level of toughness. Um, and I think that's been what's probably been the most exciting for our offensive staff and those two guys walking in. They're both tough football players. Right? They're tough football players, and that's going to matter for us in the fall. Good bite there from Joe Sloan talking about the new wide receivers um, in C.J. Daniels and Xavion Thomas. Here he is talking about the uh, offensive line obviously being the centerpiece of this year's attack. Well, I think, you know, I think, I think everything, right, I, I started out by saying everything starts inside, right, and we're going to build from inside out. So especially when all of a sudden Nuss is coming in and, and hasn't started, his, you know, a bunch of games in the past, um, I think to have that consistency up front, right, so he can have that level of trust and just how those guys are playing, um, you know, obviously led by uh, Will and Emery and just how they show up every single day, it speaks volumes and it's, it's – I, I don't know that I could overstate um, 
what that means for a quarterback um, and what that means for our run game. Uh, from from the running back standpoint, I think you're going to see if you guys touch the ball. You know, we're going to we're going to attack people. We're going to come off the football and we're going to re reestablish the line of scrimmage. Um, with Brad Davis, his mentality, he starts with the leadership and how he sets the tempo in the room. But really, you watch um, as he's been with these guys a couple of years, you start to see it be player led. Um, and that's what we want to do. We want to establish a new line of scrimmage. We want to attack people so that they have to fit the box. And then after that, we can let our skill players go do something special on the perimeter when they get the matchups. More from the offensive line. DJ Chester has been a key addition here and someone who has pushed for starting time early in his days at LSU and now has a starting center job. Center is a hard job. Is a hard job to do, right? Every every play, you got to talk, you got to communicate, you got to get everybody on the same page. Then you got to snap the ball. Then you got to block, right? Um, and I think just how he is a, as a, a second year player um, has been able to go out and communicate effectively, consistently. Um, and then the physicality he's still able to play with, right? Even as much thinking as he may be doing, um, playing with the physicality. And I think, you know, that, that's what's been really interesting to watch. And he has four returning starters around him, right? And he's a second-year player. And his ability to step in the huddle and, and, and communicate and take charge um, has been really good to see. I think he has a lot of the traits and qualities we want this program to be about that Coach Kelly built this program on um, moving forward. And... You know, that's, that's something I think already is showing at his young age and I think will continue to show, and he'll be a great leader for LSU uh, for, for the several years to come. Uh, Stewie, this is going to be 9 and 10 back-to-back -back here, but here is Joe Sloan talking about the development of Garrett Nussmeyer and where he is from a quarterbacking standpoint, and then followed up by another soundbite on the quarterback, and this is the entire room and what the competition behind Nussmeyer looks like. Uh, looks yeah, like. no, I think with, uh, with Nuss and, and even rewinding back a couple years ago, uh, everything's been about a do-your-job mentality, right? Obviously, um, anyone who has had the opportunity to watch Garrett play, he's, he's got a ton of arm talent, he has unbelievable vision, um, and he can deliver the ball in a lot of different ways quickly. Uh, his big thing has been uh, playing within the structure of the offense and understanding when to take, when to take uh, maybe challenge a throw, right, and when not to. Um, and that's been, the big, that's been the big emphasis, right, is – is making sure just from a do your job mentality and having tight feet. When Garrett has tight feet and he has his feet underneath of him, he makes really good decisions. Um, and and so it really is a technique thing, which is in his control. So we just try to keep keep him focused on that. I've been really really pleased this spring with how he's done that. But then also um, taking over the leadership role. I, I think you know you watched and I, and and I read uh, I think Mason Taylor's comment uh, a couple weeks ago, which was which was really cool to see. You know. Just when, when all of a sudden Garrett got his opportunity in the bowl game, you could see him step into that role. And, and the relationships that he had built over time, the work that he had put in, um, guys respect that. They respect, they respect work, right? They respect work, uh, and they respect if they know you care, right, about your teammates. And they respect guys who are going to go out and do their job to the absolute best of their ability. Um, and I think that's how Garrett's uh, stepped in and, and – maybe taking advantage of his, of his new role. So it's been, it's been really good to watch, but I think his vocal leadership has really grown. Um, but I think he's playing within himself. Um, so it'll, it'll be fun. We've got a lot of work to do between now and August, uh, but, but a lot of really good things so far. What's that backup competition look like? I mean, it's been back and forth, but lately it's been Ricky Collins taking reps with the twos. So, I mean – if we're going off of what's been seen lately, it's Ricky Collins right now as QB two, which is which is very refreshing to see, honestly. Like, yeah. just to see from the knowing recruiting. Ricky like yeah. from his junior year of high school and him committing to Purdue and him going to Purdue, and then him decommitting and committing to LSU. Like, I kind of think people didn't really realize like what how competitive Ricky is one and how how good of a player he really is, and now it's starting to show at LSU. Here's the last bite. This is 13. This is on the way out. Sloan kind of stopped himself before he left the podium and wanted to make sure and give highlight to one more player before he took off. Hey, I will tell you, Shelton Sampson has made a ton of strides. I, I, I'd be remiss not to say uh, just made some really big plays the last several days. So it's been good. Not good for you with me. Yeah. Like to hear that? Hey, yeah, he went. That was not provoked. No, that was unprompted. He had in to, fact, he, he was talking about Kyron Lacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he, he wrapped up his. This is the soundbite before. This is twelve. Mm -hmm. This is the answer. He was he was answering this question on Kyron Lacy, and and as he wrapped up the the Lacy answer, 
you know, that was kind of the end of the press conference. And, you know, that's what he did. He was, hey, before I go, I got to mention Shelton Sampson. But this was the answer yeah, the before. Over, over the uh, safety was pretty good. That was pretty cool. If we can recreate that a few times, we'll be okay. Uh, Kyron, where I've been so proud of Kyron. I knew Kyron when he was like 15 years old. Um, and watching his his level of growth um, from, an, a, from a consistency standpoint, accountability, maturity, emotional, um, his growth that way. You know, everybody talks about, hey, I, I, I want to – I want to grow, right? Hey, I know these are my things I need to work on. I, I want to. It's it's not about talking about it. It's about what you do every single day, and the level of consistency that he's shown from really from the bowl game into how he's attacked the weight room to how he's been a leader and holding other players accountable um, and teaching young players what we do and how we do things. Man, that that's what's that's that is the process that then shows up at practice um, and shows up on Saturday. Kyron's going to make plays, right? But the maturity, the ability to use your emotion as your strength, and the ability to be consistent and accountable day in, day out, right? That's going to carry over, and now we see his talent show up every single play. I'm not worried about what he does on those individual routes. It's that process that he's had, and I think, you know, he and, and, and Coach Hankton and, and how they've worked together to – to what you know to to allow him to grow into that uh, has been really 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 cool to watch, um, and I think you're seeing it show up now on the practice field. And as that was wrapping up, that's where he gave the answer on Shelton Sampson. So the wide receiver room looks like it's in good spot. It's in a good spot after you're losing, you know, a couple of first round picks, a couple of top twenty picks in Neighbors and Thomas. And if you like Brian Thomas Jr., you're gonna love Shelton Sampson. <laughs> Put it that way, because he is a freak. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, with the ball in his hands. Once the light bulb goes off, it's going to be Shelton. Sims, it's going to be curtains for everybody because no, I agree. he's probably the most talented in the room. It just hasn't clicked yet. Yeah, it hasn't him. clicked yet for him. And I think for Sloan to go out of his way, like you said, he was walking off the podium, turned around, and was like, "Hold on, oh, nobody asked me about Shelton Sims. Let me tell you real quick, he's made some massive strides. So don't forget about him, right? Because when you think about what they've added in that room, you have what five, six receivers that, well, maybe unproven at LSU three of which have ability and have started. Like, C.J. Daniels went over 1,000 yards. He's one of, what, three receivers or five receivers, yeah. I think, in the country that – Yeah, I think it's six. Yeah, that's six returning. receivers. Yeah. yeah, that's returning and went over 1,000 yards their previous year. And then you have – I think everybody has their woes or their qualms about what you've got from Kyron Lacey just because the drops have been an issue. But if he's working like that and he finally gets the opportunity to be, like, the, the guy – whether it be, I don't know if he'll be your leading staff producer, but he's definitely the leader of that room. And I think that's kind of what he's been biding his time and waiting for. Because do you remember when he came in here, we interviewed him, and he was saying, like, I want to see the effort and intensity that we used to have at, at ULL. Yeah. Like, that's what those, the first thing he said. It's like, we're, we're, I'm trying to get people together to go throw, and Garrett Nussmeyer has taken that upon himself also. So you fast forward two years, and now they're finally getting to that point of, okay, this is what the work looks like. And I feel like that's a big rubber stamp of what Kyron Lacey's tried to kind of implement to that room. I'm excited to see Kyle Parker. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. That sophomore wide receiver class. Aaron Anderson. Really? Yeah. Oof. But that, that yeah, they, I mean, there's only one ball and you got, I mean, you got, you got six or seven. To play yeah, with. exactly. And you heard what he thought about Mason Taylor. And Xavier yeah, Thomas. They're gonna be a, there's going to be a, a big effort to get him the ball. Yeah. And I think he's going to be one of the biggest winners with Nussmeier as a quarterback now. Mm-hmm. Oh, Mason Taylor? Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. You know, I mean, all those running yards that Daniels would accumulate are now going to go to the tight end on those and, dump downs. And Mason Taylor is, is – one of them. Like he's, I agree. <laughs> I agree, I agree like with Sloan. I mean, you know, obviously Sloan knows the team way better than we do, but, I mean, I, I agree outside looking in. Mason Taylor's one of your best players on the team. Yeah, best football players, yeah, like absolutely. generally. Yeah, I mean, never makes mistakes. You know what I mean? I can think of one mistake he's made since he's been here. The, the, the drop at Bama. But, I mean. You know? I mean, yeah. it happens. No harm, no foul. Yeah, right. I mean, it happened. Right. But, I mean, the next play, I mean, it really kind of – it was it was over. Yeah. But, I mean – he was hurt. But he's also made really? some plays at LSU oh where you're God. like, damn, I, mean, I didn't realize Mason His Taylor freshman had that. season going into that year, the story was that they didn't have a tight end in sight. Yeah. Like, they didn't have a tight end on campus. Like, they were like, who are they going to play at tight end? You're going to have to play by the, the freshman. By the middle of the year, by the end of the year, you had a top 15 tight end in the, in, in the, the sport. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, Mason Taylor is – like, a long time pro, right? Like, like, yeah, I mean, like if he's at like Georgia, he's playing like 100%. Brock Bowers. Like they're putting an emphasis on getting the ball to Mason Taylor. Yeah, he's kind of been somebody that you've 
just haven't really noticed, but you would notice if he didn't play. Yeah, exactly. Like well, you some, did. Right. Yeah, you did. It's it's one of those guys that like he doesn't I don't think he wows you with his athleticism, but everything he does, he does the right way. And if he wasn't on the team, especially that freshman year where he comes in and it's like, I guess you have to start the true freshman. And then he's making huge plays in the Florida State game where he's he has enough wherewithal to be able to get out of bounds and give you a chance to even compete and win yeah. that game. And then from what he's done, you can go to the Alabama two point conversion, like all of these things. He's he's put a lot of he's put a lot in the bucket for LSU, and it's somebody that really has kind of been an unsung hero for you. That's going to get drafted and probably play ten years in the league. You're like oh, Mason Taylor. Taylor's still playing, yeah, <laughs> still, still scoring, making plays, still, still making plays, yeah. like, making plays. <laughs> like he might be like like he is. See, you said like athletic. I, I think he has that. No, he definitely is. He like, definitely has. Yeah, that. Like, it just doesn't wow you, might, right? Because of like all the other. Freaks that they have in the room, like the Pimptons and yeah, the shiny, Green, the shiny, the shiny toys. toys. But you got the Mason Taylor might not be the sexiest, but he is consistent, consistent marriage material, right? That's right. You got to marry that. You got to marry him to dad. And I think I think he's going to have a like you saw. I don't want to say it a step back, but just the way that the offense kind of turned into the Jaden Daniel show. I think with Nuss, you're going to see a lot of those like. It's going to be more of a Brian Kelly stapled offense. You saw it in the bowl game. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're Taylor, using the Taylor. Everybody's getting the ball. Taylor was back in it, you know. Uh, Range Fit. Remember Range Fit, water's favorite drinking buddy. You can purify your daily hydration with optimized electrolyte mix that you see right here, centerpiece of our set every day. A couple of flavors, including the lemon lime, blueberry, and this one, the strawberry Ooh, kiwi. Baby. All of it you can pick up online at rangefit.com. If you're looking for them, rangefit.com. Uh, easy recognizable logo, uh, easy website. You can shop the product online, rangefit.com. Uh, but this is a hydration product that is sugar free, uh, it's soy free, gluten free, dairy free. Uh, it is extremely refreshing. We start our day with it every single day here uh, on the Colada Show. I would suggest uh, that you make it a part of your, uh, your routine as well. Range Fit at rangefit.com. Rangefit.com is where you pick them up. All right, come back with us. Uh, we'll keep it rolling here. Jordy Collada Show live here from Click Here Digital. Red Stick Sports, a local staple in Baton Rouge to all sports fans, was founded back in 1981 and has remained a family business for over 40 years. Today, they still have the great selection on the floor, but they're also a leader in custom apparel for businesses, sports teams, and other groups. Take it from us, everybody over here at FM Digital Media. They help us out with all of our apparel. Let them help you out today. Go ask for Cody over at Red Stick Sports. Check him out online at redsticksports.biz. The Jordy Collada Show is brought to you by A Bears Lawn Maintenance. Commercial or residential, A Bears Lawn Maintenance is ready to work. A Bears can tackle all your homeowners' association requirements. Call Blake at 225 485 8022. A Bears Lawn Maintenance. Hey, Tiger fans, when you're traveling through Natchez, Mississippi, make sure to visit Tom and Wright Granning at Go Mart and On The Go Deli, where you can fill up your tank and your belly. Go Mart has clean restrooms, community coffee, an awesome beer cave, and a great selection of anything you may need on your trip. Located at 4 Sergeant Prentice Drive as you're entering Natchez on the left. Also stop by Wardo's Po' Boys at 309 North Broadway on the beautiful Natchez Bluff, where the Po' Boys are so good you'll swear you're in Cajun country. At Auctioner, we know healing is a team sport. That's why we've partnered with world-renowned orthopedic surgeon, Dr. James Andrews, to create the Auctioner Andrews Orthopedics and Sports Medicine Institute. Whether you're a professional athlete or a weekend warrior, our team of specialists are dedicated to getting you back in the game. So whatever your reasons are for reaching your personal best, we've only got one, you. Auctioner Andrews Institute, long live you. All right, buddy. Make nope. it a good shot. Oh, yeah. Sticking the roof in. For a hole in your roof, for a whole new roof. Roof, roof, roof. Hey, Greg, roof up. 
Rusa. Roofs up. Roofs up. Roofs up. Roofs up. Roofs up. Beautiful roof every single time. True. True. Well, the Oscars Andrews Sports Medicine Institute collaborative effort uh, was uh, an idea from Dr. Andrews and myself to bring together two great names, the Andrews name and the Oscar name, to elevate the quality of care for athletes in the state of Louisiana, where he's from. I always thought I would come back to Louisiana to practice orthopedics with my subspecialty being sports medicine. This was an opportunity through Oshners to come back and work the entire state to help develop and take sports medicine to a new level. As an orthopedic surgeon, what this means in the future in terms of you know, access for our community, to the type of care that Dr. Andrews pioneered, words can't describe how valuable that is. Oshner has a great opportunity here to, to really grow, and Dr. Burnham, of course, is the mainstay of making that happen. If you want to have first-class sports medicine care, check in with Dr. Burnham and his group, and you'll be more than impressed and pleased. Fourier Insurance Agency, established in 1946, helping you with your home, auto, commercial, life and health insurance needs, Around in Baton Rouge at 4275 Government Street and online at FourierAgency.com. Whatever insurance you're in the market for, home, auto, commercial, contractors, life and health, get in touch with Fourier Insurance Agency, FourierAgency.com, or give them a call at 225-383-0682, Fourier Agency. Get Gordon. And get it done, yeah. Everybody know Gordon in a 225. And he done link with Big Four. He got Buku ties for Rice sliding, flying in a new cool ride. And every time I ride by, I see a brand new sign. I'm a Gordon. I know that he gon' get it done. Whether it's a big truck crash or a hit and run. Recovery funds, he fighting to get a ton. Mike Epps, man, we all about the Benjamin. Handling injuries, man, are you kidding me? Gordon McKernan, that champion energy. Yeah, family man with a family plan. Get Gordon, he gon' fix it like a handy man. Get Gordon. And get it done. What's up? What's happening? Chilling with a couple of cool guys. You? Chilling and watching some tube. <laughs> Hold on. Did you do it? Hold on. Did you do it? Roof up. Hold on. Roof up. Roof up. Roof up. Hold on. Uh, Hold on. Uh, Hold on. Beautiful roof every single time. True. True. At Ochsner, we know healing is a team sport. That's why we've partnered with world-renowned orthopedic surgeon, Dr. James Andrews, to create the Ochsner Andrews Orthopedics and Sports Medicine Institute. Whether you're a professional athlete or a weekend warrior, our team of specialists are dedicated to getting you back in the game. So whatever your reasons are for reaching your personal best, we've only got one, you. Ochsner Andrews Institute, long live you. Head health is incredibly important for our student athletes. One of the best ways we're trying to address concussions is on the front end. We're trying to prevent these before they happen. And a big part of that is speaking to the athletes, letting them know what to expect. Okay, speaking to the parents, what to look out for, talking to the coaches so they know the vital importance. Some of the big things we're looking for with the concussion, which is, you know, a traumatic brain injury is one, was there a mechanism? Was there an injury that took place that could lead to this? Often a direct blow to the head, a head-to-head -head hit. If someone's showing signs of concussion, our first step is always to remove them from activity, get them to a place where there's less stimuli, where we can really just sit down and get a feel for the athlete, what they're feeling. We're looking for headache, we're looking for Dizziness, any sign that coordination is off, that something's just not right, get a good evaluation of them to understand what's going on. It's not worth the risk that may be there to kind of ignore it because there are very serious consequences if we don't treat a concussion properly.
focus on getting deposits. Evil in the way, now I'm just driving around it. They said I need the soul searching, I already found it. I unlocked my other side, now I'm sounding astounded. Drive by and let it ride like a whip in a Tesla. Pressure never fades me, cause I'm bigger than pressure. I'm on my grind, bullshit, can't fit on my schedule. I'ma do what's best for me, you can keep all your lectures. Spend the summer stacking bread, might be gone to November. Pulling up like Trey Young just to freeze up December. I got this on the blood like traditional sinners. OGs love me, so I hang with traditional winners. I took a break for a minute, I had to go charge up. All right, welcome back. Wednesday edition of the Jordy Collada Show. A day later here with our guy, Wilson Alexander, because LSU was on the Ponderosa yesterday going through practice. We gave you some of Joe Sloan's bites, and some of those questions were coming from Wilson, including about the tight end room, which we elaborated a little bit about Mason Taylor and went on. But uh, it's good to be uh, joined by Wilson Alexander, as always, weekly here, especially as LSU closes up spring football practice uh, before we give Wilson a couple of weeks and months off before we get him back here for football season. Uh, Wilson, good morning. Good to see you, my friend. Good morning, Doherty. How are you? Doing good. Uh, you got to hear from Joe Sloan yesterday, the offensive coordinator. Uh, new play caller this year. What's that mean for the offense? What'd you learn yesterday? Well, you know, same offensive playbook. Joe sort of emphasized that in some ways that the plays are kind of have been in this, you know, available to them. But it's certainly a different viewpoint of the offense uh, and a different uh you know, set of players that you're trying to mold this offense around. And I think that shows up in a few different ways, particularly in the run game like we've talked about before with LSU now really putting an emphasis on its offensive line uh, and trying to kind of use that as the catalyst of the run game instead of sort of what Jaden Daniels did in zone reads and inside zone. And then also, like you mentioned with the tight ends, that's another example of that with a guy like Mason Taylor, who now you look up and he's the most experienced offensive skill player on the team. He's got 25 starts. Uh, that's more than anybody else on the skill players. And it's the second most uh, out of any offensive player behind Will Campbell and actually Miles Frazier, uh, who started a lot of football games over the last couple of years there on the offensive line. And so, you know, I think Joe's trying to, based on what he said, you know, take this offense that has been in place uh, that is sort of the, the Mike Denbrock offense still. It's not like, like we said, the, the, the playbook isn't completely different, um, but sort of just fit it to what they have. Uh, in order to, you know, try to maximize the personnel um, and try to get the most out of them. Um, Quarterback standpoint, I thought it was interesting, the backup answer yesterday. It seems like Ricky Collins has taken the strides that they were hoping he would here going into his next season. What what, what did you take away there from the backup competition? Definitely. You know, we we talked to Joe after practice yesterday, and at practice, Ricky was getting most of the second team reps, and he got a lot of the second team reps, uh, and some of the other practices that we've gotten to see as well, there's clearly that, that quarterback competition for the backup spot uh, is is going on here between him and A.J. Swan. And Joe Sloan is very complimentary of Ricky, saying over the last four practices or so, he's seen him make quite a few strides, um, you know, just start to get more comfortable in the offense, have more of a control over everything, instead of just kind of going out there and using it as athleticism, really being able to sort of manage what's going on and be that orchestrator that you have to be a quarterback. A.J. Swan is still, in Joe's words, kind of getting used to this new offense. There's a lot that LSU does offensively. And although he has the experience of starting 12 games at Vanderbilt, you know, this is the first time that he's in this playbook and trying to kind of get used to that. Uh, Might be taking him a little bit longer. So, you know, come fall camp, maybe we'll see more out of A.J. Swan. um, And maybe that I'm sure that kind of backup competition would continue to go on. Uh, even into the season, probably, and it's really you know just to have and you know to know who would be coming into a game if Garrett uh, if something were to happen to him. Um, but he you know he still was complimentary of AJ in terms of his quick release and said that when AJ is comfortable, um, he can be really really good at distributing the football on time. And so I think it's just a matter of with him getting comfortable um, in order to and like we said that just comes with learning the offense, having some more experience with this group in order to be able to make those sorts of plays. And then even Colin Hurley, who as a freshman, you know, he's not getting a lot of reps uh, when we're able to see practice. You know, I mean, when you're the fourth guy on the depth chart and there's only so many reps to go around, uh, you're kind of the odd man out in that, in that regard. But he's still, you know, able to – his accuracy has improved, Joe said, um, and he's kind of just getting used to the speed of the college game. We can see Colin when, you know, he's just throwing on air. He's got some arm talent. The ball zips out of his hand a good bit. And this is a guy who only just turned 17. Um, so those are some you know encouraging things for a guy uh, who's an early enrollee just kind of going through his first spring practice. But definitely sort of the the, uh, the most notable thing, as you mentioned, is that Ricky Collins has been able to develop like you would want to now going into his sophomore year. 
be right in the thick of that backup quarterback competition. The offensive line, obviously, is the strong suit of this team. Uh, but DJ Chester is the new face. You could feel Chester's emergence last season. Where is he now going into year two? He's your starting center, and he's somebody who really carries himself with some confidence. We got to speak to DJ a few weeks ago. Really well spoken. Uh, you know, he even though in the, he uh, he recognized that even though he's the new face on this offensive line, that it's still his responsibility as the center to be out there making the calls and doing everything vocally that a center has to do. That's not an easy spot to come in when you've got four guys around you who have basically started together for two years. You know, and that they have some cohesion and they've played a lot of football together. Now you're the new guy in the middle of it trying to tell them what to do. But DJ's been able to take that on well, and that's the part that, Joe, that stood out to Joe Sloan the most too, was that he hasn't backed away from the vocal responsibilities of the center, getting everybody lined up pre-play, you know, making the calls and the checks to, uh, you know, identifying the Mike linebacker and doing all those sorts of things, and then just, you know, snapping the ball and blocking. You know, uh, DJ's got, a, you know, certainly physical. He's a big guy. Somebody who LSU, uh, you know, Brad Davis called him before he got to LSU and said, hey, how do you feel about playing center? And DJ kind of suspected that might happen, and he's really taken it on. And now here going into his sophomore year, he's going to be that starting center. Wide receiver seems like a place, too, that they have some confidence, obviously, in Kyron Lacey who is the experienced veteran coming back there. But then after that, it seems like you, you've got some spots up for grabs and, and up in the air with a lot of names. I mean, he was he made sure and mentioned Shelton Sampson. He was very high on the transfers. What do you take of the competition? Yeah, it's ongoing, certainly, and it'll be throughout fall camp, especially because you you know LSU brings in C.J. Daniels and Xavion Thomas with the intention of them being big, big pieces of this offense constantly saying how you know their experience was what they needed to bring in after you lose Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas. You know, you, they, LSU went out and got them for a reason. Um, but so far here, it's been Kyron Lacey and Chris Hilton as the mainstays on the first-team offense. Aaron Anderson's been getting a lot of run with the first-team offense, too. And partially, it's because of you know, just how they're playing. I mean, Kyron Lacey has been playing really well this spring by all accounts. Chris Hilton's been playing really well, been just consistent all spring, um, which is a really great sign from him. Aaron Anderson's done some good things as well as he continues to develop. Kyle Parker's been in the mix too. But when you look at guys like C.J. Daniels and Xavion Thomas, as Joe said yesterday, uh, this is kind of the case for a lot of the transfers. You know, they're learning a new playbook, similar to A.J. Swan in some regards, you know, in that way. But it's still standing out to them that kind of once they have that completely under their feet, you know, they're going to be big pieces of this offense and major contributors. Are they going to start every single game? You know, we'll see. It looks like LSU's going to have some options and maybe be able to rotate guys around a good bit and kind of have more of a target uh, distribution uh, but amongst the wide receivers than it had last year where everything was so concentrated with Malik and Brian Thomas and then Kyron Lacey as well. You know, it looks like there's going to be probably more like four, maybe five guys who are really within that rotation and CJ and Xavion being two of them. Um, CJ, you know, is somebody who has already shown up to be consistent physical through the catch mm -hmm. that word physical came up with him and Xavion Thomas yesterday, um, which was, you know, sort of thing that stood out the most to Sloan so far. He thinks that's going to be really important uh, and, you know, a key for this team in the fall that those two are as physical as they are, but the work ethic has been good. He said, and also the fact that especially, you know, already with a guy like Xavion, they used him on a jet sweep earlier this spring. You can see his speed and his feel for space is really good. And with CJ, you know, he's able to, excuse me, he, they already identified him as someone like, when we need to play, we can go to him. It's just mm -hmm. a matter of them get, both getting the playbook underneath them and being able to be comfortable in this offense. So he thinks that, uh, Sloan thinks anyway, that come fall camp, those two will even emer emerge even more. How far away do you think Shelton Sampson is? I mean, is he another year? Maybe. I mean, it depends. You know, he's, if he can have a really good offseason, then he's going to be more in the mix. Um, but so far, what we've seen with Shelton is that he continues to be on the third team offense. Um, that's just kind of the reality of it whenever, you know, again, these are brief practice snippets mm -hmm. uh, that we've gotten to see so far. Um, but so just, you know, everybody keep that kind of caveat in mind here that but when we've been out there, you know, the LSU typically runs through its first, its second and its third team offense. Uh, on air, does a little quick uh, thing at the beginning of practice where those two teams do like half field, uh, run a few plays. Um, and Shelton's always been one of those third team receivers. Um, and so that just sort of seems to be where he's out on the depth chart. At Brian Kelly said right at the beginning of the spring that he's just got to be get he's got to get more physical off the line of scrimmage. Mm -hmm. You know, be able to use his length and his size downfield because it's there. You know, we've seen we can see it since his high school tape that it's when he's able to do that. We saw a catch a couple of weeks ago that when he's able to get off the line of scrimmage and get downfield, it, it, he can be really, really good. It's just a matter of kind of working on those releases, 
being able to avoid press coverage and, you know, shed defenders in order to be able to utilize those strengths. And so if he can have a good off season and get himself in the mix and he'd be right there come preseason camp. But right now it looks like he's still with the third team offense. Uh, Blake Baker is constantly uh, shadowed by Harold Perkins. It feels like on the practice field, uh, what's the relationship there? And, and what do you see kind of the role of Perkins here now in, in, in Baker's lead leadership? You know, I practiced just, uh, it was yesterday, uh, there was a moment where, and this has happened every single time we've seen practice, you know, Blake Baker was coaching up Harold Perkins and coaching up all the linebackers, but there was just a little technique thing, thing within a drill where there was basically the drill was designed to, to uh, you know, work on get shedding blocks and sort of absorbing, run, uh, excuse me, absorbing blocks and then shedding those. And Harold, you know, Blake came up with him to work with on his hand placement with him and just the way that he had his hands you know, formed and, and then using them against the, um, I guess, the blocker in this case. And we've just seen little stuff like that throughout the preseason. That's what you expect from all coaching, obviously. Uh, but there's a little bit more of a focus uh, placed on it with Blake and Harold because of the need for Harold to be, um, you know, able to ha- play that inside linebacker position. It just seems like Blake has been on top of that all spring, helping him get better, uh, trying to work on those little technical aspects of inside linebacker play that Harold needed to improve upon. It'll be fascinating to hear from Blake on Thursday. There's a press conference with him. Uh, I guess that's just tomorrow now. Um, and talk to him more about, you know, his work with Harold and what they're really focusing on and uh, that moved inside linebacker. Because we know it was so effective with Demone Clark a few years ago. It'll be interesting to see, you know, how that compares or is different from what he's having to do here with Harold. Um, but it's certainly a lot of work going into him. Uh, uh, you know, Harold, excuse me. A lot of work going into what they're doing with Harold this uh, spring. And Blake has clearly been on top of that. Um, Corey Raymond is, is hard on his group. Uh, PJ Woodland is, is one that he's seemingly trying to make sure and, and get the standard across to, uh, what are you seeing from the defensive backfield now that, that, now that Raymond is out there every day? Well, you know, they're still getting used to Corey in some ways. Yeah. I remember talking to Javion Tovian a few weeks ago and, you know, they were kind of still in that point where they're learning how, what, it, what a new coach wants in some ways. And we, you know, yesterday there was doing a drill and, you know, they were not quite doing it the way Corey wanted them to be doing it. And he let them know that. Um, he certainly you know, been on top of them throughout the spring, you know, trying to get them to understand what he wants. And, uh, you know, whether that's, you know, technique wise or just, you know, sort of certain levels of effort and practice. And, you know, that was kind of what happened yesterday. He was telling them that they were, you know, not necessarily uh, taking advantage of the drill. Um, and then, you know, they kind of, you know, not backpedaling properly. Um, and so what we've seen, though, in terms of like how who's going to play and how is this going to shake out come, you know, the fall is not a whole lot of separation at this point. You know, that's uh, at least, uh, you know, that's tangible. You know, Xavier Tobiano and Ashton Stamps have been those first team cornerbacks. Um, and that's not necessarily a surprise because, you know, they were kind of the first teamers by the end of the year. You got a little bit more experience there. And also, you know, you've got a guy like P.J. Woodland, who was certainly impressed, but he's an early enrollee. And then, you know, Jair Brown is transferring for the first time from Ohio State. You know, this is his first spring at LSU. You know, J.K. Johnson seemed like he was limited at times this spring so far. Um, And then Zy Alexander is, of course, not practicing as he recovers from the ACL. So, you know, it just feels like, okay, those guys are your first teamers right now. If you played a game tomorrow, they'd be the first ones out there on the field. Um, But it looks like LSU could have some more competition there you know, throughout the preseason as they go into the you know, maybe even uh, closer up toward game week uh, against you know, USC because you got to figure out who's, you know, let that cream rise to the top and figure out who your best options are there. Um, it's going to be fascinating to watch that unfold because I think it's far from over. Running back position is another one that's very competitive, it seems like. And um, when, when you talk about a back like Josh Williams being in the fold, you can hear the security that it brings the play caller, Joe Sloan, uh, what's what do you see kind of the order there and and what could be the plan? Well, right now the pecking order looks like Josh Williams and then Caleb Jackson. And, you know, certainly though they're going to get a lot of touches, both of them. And then, you know, add Kaden K- K- Durham to that mix mm-hmm. and then we'll potentially see whatever happens with Trey Holly and then maybe even if LSU were to go after another running back in the portal, we'll have to see, you know, in a couple of weeks here uh, if, that ever, if that comes to fruition. A lot of that probably has somewhat to depend on Trey Holly's situation. Um, but with only two scholarship running backs out there right now, it's Josh Williams and Caleb Jackson and then a host of walk-ons um, who have gotten a lot of touches, too, to try to divvy that up. Josh is someone who continues to run with that first-team offense, though. You know, Caleb got a few t- uh, few carries with Garrett Nussmeyer, a few reps with him uh, during some individual work yesterday, but a lot of it was Josh. 
Um, and that's not a surprise because he's that steady hand. You know, he's the person who is now a sixth year senior who does all the things in pass protection that you want, who, um, you know, is still a, a, certainly a capable runner as well. And while John, excuse me, Caleb is certainly going to be a big piece of what they do offensively, mm-hmm. don't get me wrong. There's just, like you said, there's that steadiness with Josh. There's that reliability with Josh that would lend him to continue to be the first team running back um, here at this, certainly at this point of spring practice. You know, but again, Caleb, uh, here's the, that's the thing, I think the thing about it is that, you know, Joe was asked yesterday about having a bell cow and he said, well, we're still going to spread carries around and sort of divvy that up. Like it's not just going to be one guy touching the football all the time. Frank Wilson has never really operated his rooms that way. Um, even, you know, his prior stint at LSU and in the last two years, we certainly didn't see it like that. And that seems like it's going to be that case again, even though LSU's got fewer running backs this year, um, they're certainly going to be sharing the carries um, and Josh Williams is going to be a big piece of that. And so is Caleb Jackson. He's, he's going to be a big piece of that. I think he's going to have a huge year. Um, but just at this point in the spring, when you look at the first team offense, it continues to be Josh Williams for all those other reasons. It makes a lot of sense why. I mean, really, when, when you're talking about a new play caller and just the, the stability. I, I thought Josh Williams was one of their best players down the stretch last year. I mean, really, I mean, he was as reliable and as consistent as, as, as the team could, could present. Um, all right, Wilson, so obviously the defensive line is something that there's questions on, but you can't take any answers away here in, in spring, right? It's not like the, the transfer portal is going to unload over the next week and a half. I mean, there's just work to do <laughs> after these, these workouts, right? Yeah, exactly. It's like we're all just kind of in wait-and-see mode in terms of who are they going to add through the transfer portal. Like the biggest notable development on the defensive line at this point has been that they added Gio Paez, who is not going to practice this spring because he won't enroll until the summer. Like the guy is not even here in the spring, and that's maybe the most notable development. Uh, not, And I, I say that, and I, and I feel like that discounts you know, the guys who are there, yeah. the, what the work that they're doing. Um, and I don't mean to necessarily do that. It's just that, like you said, we aren't going to really know exactly what they have at defensive line until they go through the spring portal window because it feels like that is a position group, and uh, as I think we all understand it, to be a position group that isn't set yet, you know, that they're mm-hmm. going to try to add to. Um, and so that's, again, not to discount the work that those guys are doing and how they're trying to get better. It's just that, you know, they're going to continue to add to that position, and so then we're going to have to all reevaluate, you know, probably at some point in May once they finish doing so, okay, who do they have now on the defensive line? And um, you know, so it is hard to t- draw any sort of firm conclusions from that. What we've seen so far is Jacoby and Guillory and Jalen Lee have typically been the first team uh, defensive tackles. The second teamers have been, uh, let's see, Sean Washington and Preston Hickey, a former walk-on um, who transferred over from Oklahoma State, I guess, over a year ago now. Um, and then on that third team was uh, Kimo Macanioli and Demirion Johnson, although Demirion wasn't at practice yesterday. And so um, you know, that's kind of been the, the order at this point at defensive tackle. But again, it just feels like they're, they've already added one and they're probably going to add a couple more uh, during that second portal window in a few weeks, when that, over, that opens up in a few weeks. Uh, anything special teams that you're watching, stories here in spring? I know it's kind of a forgotten storyline during this part of the, the yeah. schedule. I mean, is there anything working that's worth paying attention to? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. We haven't gotten to see a whole lot of it yet, but obviously, you know, how does Davion look as a punt returner? And also, is Peyton Todd ready to just be the punter? Um, because, you know, Jay Brandenblit came in the last couple of years. Peyton Todd's been on this team for a long time. And, you know, you don't ever want to have to think about your punter. Um, but that's basically, like, you want to make sure you don't have to think about Peyton Todd, that he can just go out there and, and be an effective punter. This will be the first time in his career that he's in that role. Um, and LSU's got another walk-on punter on the team as well. But uh, it looks like the job is Peyton's. And so that's certainly one thing to watch and monitor, uh, I guess, probably more into preseason camp. Um, because at this point, we just haven't seen them punt a whole lot. Um, but also, you know, on the other side of that, you know, Xavion brought, was brought in here as somebody who had averaged 12.6 yards per punt return over the last two years in Mississippi State, and can he continue to replicate that production? Brian Kelly was asked about it, I guess, a couple of weeks ago and sort of uh, tamped down the importance of punt returns, um, but it still feels like that's an effective thing that you could get out of Xavion Thomas, and there would be very little reason to waste that. Um, you know, they want to be able – they need to be able, without an offense that's probably going to be the number one offense – you know, you expect some level of regression, even if it's maybe not a lot, um, to get a few more yardage out of, yards out of your punt return game. You know, I don't have to f- call fair catch every single time. Yeah. Uh, the little that we saw of Xavion, um, he was able to, you know, catch the ball cleanly every time. Kyle Parker and Andrew Anderson are back there as well, getting reps as well as Javon Nicholas. Um, but, you know, Xavion was brought in, you know, as a guy with that kind of experience. You'd expect him to sort of be in that position come fall. Um, we'll just have to see what kind of a difference he can make. Uh, Wilson, you are obviously the authority when it comes to LSU football in our market, but you have been on the LSU women's basketball beat 
at times. What do you expect Angel Reese and Haley Van Lith to decide here on the uh, as the time as the timeline closes for their their choice? The clock is ticking. Well, you flatter me uh, with that with the first part of that statement. <laughs> I don't know about all that. But we only deal with the, the um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, likewise. Clearly, um, but the you know. What do I expect them to do? Gosh, I, I really have no clue uh, into into their thinking. Any sort of guess I would make would be completely a sure. uh, shot in the dark. I mean, I, I just don't know. Um, you know, it's yeah, I, I don't know. What I, would I really you do? Uh, well, <laughs> Wilson what protecting do his journalistic see, integrity. If I was Haley, I, I would probably come back. Um, mm-hmm. And if I was Angel, I would probably leave. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's, I, I guess, you know, if Haley, if could, she could come back and maybe score a little bit more and be a bigger part of that offense – Certainly, compared to what we saw in the in the tournament, um, then that's probably what I would do. But I'm also not in her shoes with the kind of uh, endorsement money that she makes, and I really don't know the full scope of her situation. So uh, I guess that's what I would do. But I guess we're just all going to have to wait and see all day long, constantly checking notifications to find out what they ended up deciding. Uh, very tough for our boy to take off his journalistic hat. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> very uncomfortable to give his opinion. Right. Right. That's right. That's right. Here on I'm the I'm opinion the side, he's yeah, like, "You boys, you, 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 columnist, you so. guys handle that. Y'all go run and play with your ball. I only deal with the facts." <laughs> uh, our guy, uh, he's the best. Make sure to follow him online and social media at wh alexander underscore Blake Baker tomorrow. Right? Yeah, yeah, that'll be fun talking to him for the first time. I'd love to know when he started wearing cleats to practice. Yes. I, 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 probably won't, I probably won't waste a question during the press conference in that, but I think we'd, uh, I'd like to know when he started doing that. We expect that next Tuesday. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> Y'all have a good one. There he is, Wilson Alexander. Covers LSU football. Good stuff from Wilson there on the practice field yesterday. And a couple of takeaways here early on. Look out for the special teams with LSU. They're going to change their tone here. I mean, it's time to turn yeah. into a playmaking aspect. It's been way too long now. And you, got too many, you got so many playmakers. Too yes, to... it's been way too long. I mean, there's no excuse for LSU's roster not to produce touchdowns from that position. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, change the scoreboard yeah. from that position because they've been doing it since the 80s. Make teams not want <laughs> I mean, to like. They've been doing it for a long time. I yeah. mean, you know, Eddie Kennison's been back there when I was a kid. I mean, you could go back every year. Almost. Kennison. Billy <laughs> Cannon. Yeah, I mean, right, to the original. <laughs> I mean, the original. Right? But, I mean, and everybody along the way. Yeah. I mean, from Kevin Falk to Tyron Matthew to Pat Pete to Odell Beckham Trendy. to – I mean, trend in holiday. DJ and, Chart. I mean, the only thing, the only, the only problem when you start this game is that you leave somebody out. Yeah. Skyler Green. Mm. Stingley almost had one. Sting. <laughs> he never came closer than his first. That first one. one. <laughs> his first one. You never forget that first time. <laughs> to, oh, I mean, he, he didn't want to go. He did want to go down. <laughs> he nearly broke it's it. The most effort we saw. I mean, that's he the hardest he's ever had to it. try and played college football. Yeah. Uh, but it's time. I mean, it's it's. It's time for LSU to become a threat Man, the, back there. His freshman again. season was so good. Oh, oh, the best. Geez. The best. The absolute best. Um, so you think it's Xavion? No, Aaron Anderson experiment is over? I don't think it's over. I think it's just Xavion just proven. Like, you yeah. know, you got that proven factor of him being a returner in the league. Shout out Greg Clayton. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, it kind of saved your season in no the doubt. sense when you didn't have anybody that you – I mean, nobody could catch it. Go nobody catch could ball, catch the ball. I mean, the best wide receiver in the draft couldn't catch it. <laughs> Jack Besh was back there. They br- I think they Jack just – Which they sides. broke him. They, they did. They broke Malik at returner for some reason. I wish he would have caught one of those. Because I, I wanted to see him, him back ch- there. I wish they would have given him another chance the next week. Big no, not the next you. week. Yeah, uh, I mean, no. against Southern? Yeah. yeah, I think yeah, just like throw uh, him out there. Like, go, go. I think the, do what just, you're supposed to do. The mental aspect of it was. I mean, was weird. I, nearly to me, broke he, the man. To me, he crossed the mental hurdle. The next play in that game. Yeah, he had like three catches. Right, on huge that drive. catches. Yeah, <laughs> pepper him. I mean, a lot of people would have had alligator hands on that. <laughs> like, hey, uh, damn, don't, that throw, don't, don't throw it to me. Don't throw it to me. I'm still back on those punt returns that I muffed on national TV. He wanted to go under the turf. He was just so just it was dead inside. He's like, Well, you can still play receiver. <laughs> you you gotta get catch, out there, coach. You gotta ball. make a play. All right. <laughs> get comfortable. And we're coming to you. I like. guess what, Peyton Todd Ramos is back too, huh? For yeah. kicker. Yeah. And then Slade. Uh, I put Caleb Jackson back with kickoff. Oh, kickoff. Okay, they did. Time. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. keep him back there. Just <laughs> in college, he's 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 a Four net step away he's, from being gone. He's a headache waiting to have. Golly, I would not want to see him back no. there if I was on the other team. Like, no don't way. kick it to twenty eight, please. <laughs> and then you'll have the uh, the old school 
kick in college, and when you turn on the NFL, yeah. you'll be like, what am I looking I mean, at? Yeah, what is this? The Super Bowl picture is going to be awful. It you know, like the most awful. iconic picture you can take, yeah. I guess, the from flash sports. Bulbs. Yeah, the flash, the flash photography of a Super Bowl opening kick, and then this one's going to be like, can't get everybody on the screen at the same time. <laughs> You have to take a wide screen. That's good. It's gonna. Bl- I'm telling you, if you woke up out of a coma and watched the first Monday Night Football game, be like, "What happened to the sport I love?" No what doubt. happened to the game I love? But I think it's. I'm wish you'll get returns. Somebody's gonna put like Trent Holiday might get a phone call. Somebody's gonna make a lot of money. Yeah, I was about to say somebody's gonna be returning like the beer a, man, like the first yes. five <laughs> Michael of Lewis. Them. Yeah, they play players like that. Yeah, Little, just, you mean like just scatty? I mean, it's, make one move and you're like, recess. I can't catch that guy. That and that's what um they changed some of the rules that the XFL had like lined up and like the guy that invented this form like formula for the kickoff like did it over years of time and like this is how it's supposed to be and of course the NFL picks it up and tinkers with it and he's like well I didn't really account for <laughs> the speed in which the NFL right. plays like if you put Tyreek Hill back there there's a good chance he could run yeah, two that, or three kicks back that's what they were saying like teams are gonna start exploring like just putting putting their best yeah. like player Fastest back guy. there right like christian McCaffrey's gonna be back there for the 49ers and because all watch, you have to do is make it through one wall right. and then you got to beat the kicker and if you've seen some christian McCaffrey stanford highlights oh, he can do it that return game is serious but i would find like i don't even know if i would risk a christian McCaffrey. but if you have I somebody mean, that has like legit track, track speed, speed like, because so, there's no who pressure is, to catch it who's our who is our guy from zachary why are we discrediting christian McCaffrey for being a because he's Stud. white. No, <laughs> like, no, just don't, no, just don't want to waste him. I got from Zachary. With the guy from Zachary that caught the touchdown against uh, LSU. I mean, uh, against uh, the Saints. Was it Grayson? S- Cyril Grayson? Cyril like, Grayson. Somebody like him. Yeah. You yes. know what I mean? Like, Throw him back there. Put him back there. Like, I mean, you make one move and you get in the open and, like, people are chasing you from the from the back. Like, nobody's yeah. going to chase you. Nobody's going to catch you. Nobody's catching him. And you can't hip drop him. Can't catch him, folks. Right. Exactly. Like, you can't touch him. You'd have and, to have Deion it's going to be electric. Oh wow! I mean, this, the, the, I hope that that's what happens. I would love for them to introduce this kickoff rule and it kind of break football for at least a couple of weeks. We're like, oh wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, we didn't really right. think about this because if you, I think if you what fair catch it, like you don't get it at the twenty five. Yeah, if you fair catch it at a certain point on the field, it's like you 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 take wow. it at the thirty five or you get it at the thirty. It's a, football. Is the it's picture of football is flag. But it's it's. I mean, it's. It's a couple of really and truly, it's probably about 15, 20 years away from flag football. Yeah. I mean, or like, just like some different concept of the sport. Or you're going to get some people that are from the old guard, but my age, that are just like, my football is never going away, and they're going to change the rules back to the way they were. I wonder what's good. Yeah, that is like, a funny game to play to think about, like what football will look like in fifteen years, and like we'll still be alive. It's not so gonna like, be what? Goodell as the GM as the. Oh, he, you'll have to pry that from his cold but I mean, dead hands. They're gonna find somebody else close yeah, I mean, enough to him that they can program and get to do what they want. But program. it's not gonna be him in fifteen to twenty years. Probably his son. Yeah. Or yeah, it's it's so they know who it is. Yeah, oh, they know. Yeah. Oh yeah, they yeah. definitely already that's know. That's the future who it NFL is. commissioner, <laughs> right? Jeets territory. And then you that's the son. future's future yeah. NFL yes. commissioner. <laughs> yeah, he's probably in a lab somewhere, right? Right. So I mean, just learning the laws and rules, <laughs> right? Of how we him keep right all of our money, kid. right? Like that's the that's the club here. This Nobody is... messes with our money. <laughs> we don't pay taxes. That money stays here. Yes, you make sure. You get fifty million and dollars. Blow that. This yeah. is we'll yours. Just give you fifty million a year. I'll take that. <laughs> give you access about how much to the jet. Makes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Right. You get everything. You get. I mean, his life is penthouse apartment. Right. M and M's. Everywhere he goes is paid for. Right. And you get access to this jet forever. He like, lives I mean, like the president. Yes. Yeah, he really does. Like. <laughs> I mean, protected. I don't, pay for, I don't do anything or pay for anything. He talks once a year. I'm here. That's yeah. it. Hold a shield for these guys. Yeah. The hardest thing you Make sure to they, do is... they never have to, like... I mean, what was our boy in Washington? Dan Snyder. <laughs> I mean, he was Dan like, Snyder's got oh, no, to Raj, Raj. You're actually going to Congress for me today. <laughs> I'm in Italy. Yeah, right. I'm in the south of France, buddy. Yeah. What do you want from me? Yeah. Head to court, Raj. I'm at a wine tasting convention. I call, the NFL, call the NFL. Call the NFL representation and tell them to meet you at court. Go earn that $50 million. Yeah. Dan, this is my lawyer. <laughs> Dan Snyder is such a strange name. Weasel. Because Weasel. Uh, uh, He's Dan gone Snyder now. from the Washington Commanders, and then you got the Dan Snyder guy from 
Nickelodeon. Oh, yeah. Terrible oh, name. That gosh. is terrible namesake. Eesh. Not a lot of, I mean, I think Dan might be done. Which one? I think that, no, the Both name in general. Yeah, yeah, right. You might have yeah. to be like, oh. Yeah. I don't want well, to the Nickelodeon him. one came out a little better than the. I guess they both, no, they're both terrible bad. lives. Yeah, <laughs> both bad. Just out there, <laughs> Hollywood. What a, what a, yeah. gross what a terrible place. place. Did they put that on? That's on HBO, huh? That HBO, whole. Yeah. Uh, is it on HBO? Yeah, yeah. that whole documentary. I, I saw it. I think I saw it. I saw, saw a ton of it on Twitter. Me too. Yeah. It's like twenty minute video. It's like I can't watch all of this. I feel horrible for these people. Yeah, I feel like, like I kind of know what happened. Yeah. It's their parents, man. Yeah. Well, where are the parents? Seriously. Well, they were like. Shuffle the parents off. Yeah, but bullshit. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, what yeah, I mean? yeah. Like, I know. Uh-uh. <laughs> like, where's Aaron Rob? Right here. Where's Bieber's dad? Well, th- I mean, I guess they were saying, like, the. I watched the whole thing. The parents were saying, like, they would basically ruin their child's career if they would, like, step into something that they didn't oh, like. Because they're doing or, something like, shady. Yeah. Right. That, that would have been my first and been like, we're out of here. Like, they got, like, like, Drake Bell was, like, the big one. And, like, his dad was, like, his manager for the longest time. But they convinced him to, like... What, Dan manage? Yeah, like, they yeah they convinced him to let someone else manage him. No way. Because, it, like, no. they were saying his no dad way. was too close to it. No like, way, I'm calling that bluff. Yeah, you know what I, mean? I would like, call the bluff. Like, like, hey, you got to make, your son, hey, you gotta make you. your son a big star. There's you, a grown buddy. man calling my son right now right. at 12 a.m. No chance. Yeah, yeah I'm out. No call chance. the house phone. <laughs> Blowing it up. Like, bro... No. You want to hang out? No, I don't. <laughs> you want to watch movies? No way. No way. Um, all right, so LSU baseball this weekend, Vanderbilt. They start Thursday. So what's the deal? Jay Johnson took the phones away? Yes, he took no the phone. phones oh, away. He no, went full dad mode. This is not good. I, it makes me wonder how this much they're on their phone, good. or is this just a, you know when you kind of get punished and it's you sneak out the house and they just start, you you know. Your That's almost like, kind of something I don't want to know publicly. Yeah, but have we Taking not, your phone away. Have we, not like, done, ah, shit. have we not had players only meeting? That's where I'm really nervous at because, you, you know, like last year they had the – Powwow. The powwow where it, it kind of, you know, you saw a shift in the season, and you haven't seen that yet. So I don't, I don't know, I don't know if that speaks. I don't know if they're on their phone. I don't know if there's a reason for taking the phone away, a reason for saying it publicly. Got a lot of young guys on this team. That's true. Yeah. But of, how could it be so much of a problem that we're like, all right. What is this, Gen Z? I mean, what is this? This is a YouTube know. generation. It's the TikTok. Right. Yeah, they're always well, I don't on the see TikTok. Them on, they're not on social media a I don't lot. see them. E- like, Duke's basketball team was one of these, like, new age teams. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the guy that paints his fingernails. Like, not that. Not that. Like, no, I'm you know saying I mean? he's, but, a, like, he's he does, on TikTok. He, he's embraced the, you know, the, the, the social media culture. Like, they're doing the dances in the locker room. I'm not sure how you're supposed to coach for or against that, right? Like, I mean, if you've got, like, some policy already built in – or if you just have to embrace it because, you know, I mean, the generation that's coming up, that's how they live. That's how they were raised. That's how they they I operate. Mean, kids <laughs> riot when vibe. you take their phone away now. Like, if you take so, away at school, they're like, I'm not going to class until I get my phone back. Like, that's not how it used to be. We're like, we had cell phones whenever bro, I was in high school. We couldn't school. bring phones Yeah, we couldn't school. even bring them. There was not right. even a well, debate. I mean, there, was, there was nothing. There was no purpose to bringing the, it. That's what I think about. You like, know what text I mean? in the pocket. What do you need? Yeah, but like, I mean, like even like for me, cell phones didn't really come into like college, so you I mean, couldn't do you know, anything yeah, on it. Once you had it, you're like, all right, so what do I do now? You know what I mean? Right. Like, but now, I mean, you've pretty much got a computer in your hand. Yeah. I so know. I mean, you're 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 doing. You Every, everybody's doing so anything. distracted. You can't, yeah. I was I mean, say, you can't it ain't texting in it. class. It's definitely like. I don't I'm know how TikTok you teach like, yeah. in, in an environment of Snapchat teaching, an environment of learning, an environment of you know where where you have to master remembering things. I mean, I, the phone is just it. It's right there. Is there? It's for a conduit taking. to your brain, though. It it's really. Like, why is. do I have to learn anything when I can just look it up? I just Google this, right? Yeah. yeah. Runners on second, and third. I got this. <laughs> yeah, put it in the earpiece. <laughs> but he said at his radio show, uh, J. John said the team won't have any cell phones around the field or in the locker room for a very long time. Hey. So it might just be like corporal See. punishment here. Like, See. It's taking your phone away. I don't yeah. know what else I can do. I get these phones, I hear. <laughs> Tired of hearing ringtones. <laughs> to me, it's like a computer. Next time, they're going to take away your walk up songs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Make you play, bring the organ back. I mean, coach, you fall this weekend. Ooh, it's a bleak. It's dark. Right? I mean... You get some, some dark days. I have been steadfast in the camp of... I'm not panicking. 
Right. Not hitting the, the, the button, you know, of reset. But that's like, Southern you can You can do it with this team. Um, Baseball is a very long This has long been the season. darkest week. Yes, of Jay Johnson's tenure. Of It has. It has yeah. felt like this has kind of been. You had some dark days in that 2022 season. It's still fresh. It was, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was still, it's still early. Fresh. Yeah, yeah, early. Plenty, you can yeah. see it. This is after a national championship. Now the expectations right. have gone you absolutely. Jacob Berry and Dylan Cruz in the same lineup. I'll give you a pass. Yeah. yeah. Then you had. And then you win the natty. So, I mean, you know, yeah, your job yeah, security, right, right, you're right. in. Like you're a, in. Yeah. But and this week has felt. That one. That press conference. Two. Five. The press conference following the Southern game was dark. Did you see any of that? We oh, played it yesterday. Geez. It is. <laughs> I was I was in the dumps too. With yeah, that. like the way the team played, I'm like, damn, he, I don't I don't know what to. He had a million miles there, just oh. straight ahead. Not. I'm hurt, dog. Yeah. Yes. So any more questions? No. Good. Get me out of here. I've got baseball to coach. But and then, but if you do want some good news, Jade Newt threw, I believe this week, pitcher. I think the number like eight pitcher in the country uh, in 2022 um, had uh, elbow surgery, and now he's finally throwing live BP for the first time. He said it's not. Let me make sure I get the quote right. Uh, Jay Newt threw the hitters today at practice, and it's just about ready to go. So that's a positive. And Jake Brown hurt his knee against Florida. We we're wondering oh. why he wasn't playing. He got a little dinged up against Florida. So is he back? Uh, he's been in and out of the he lineup. He pinch hit him, yeah. Against but he's not. Uh, I guess he's not a hundred percent healthy because mm-hmm. he he. We thought that he had forgotten how many outs there were, but he was running down the line of the double play and kind of pulled up lame. And I guess that's when he hurt his knee, as opposed to we thought that he wasn't aware of the out in situation. situation. Yeah. yeah, but it, it turns out he tweaked his knee a little bit. <sighs> uh, Back to the grindstone Thursday. We'll see. Big it. spot tomorrow night. I, I mean, would imagine comes at you fast, uh, right? I mean, is he got he got to go home? And that's right? what I was about to say. I'd imagine you go home and he and announces that today. No, he won't announce that until Thursday. So Thatcher Hurd just Thatcher Hurd came out the pen. Are we? Are we he didn't pitch poorly when he came in, but it was a tough spot to come in. Just, and you got a bright spot in Cam Johnson who came into an almost unwinnable situation and that, was able to get out of it. So, look, I have forgotten more baseball. I mean, like, that guy has forgotten way more baseball than I'll ever know. I know you don't come here for baseball knowledge. It was just it – was, it was weird to me, like, if Cam Johnson was an option, like, to me, roll him out there at the start because – Best case scenario, you got lightning in a bottle, and the dude is Cam Johnson. Right. You know what I mean? Like, you recruited this guy. You won versus the bigs, this guy. I mean, there'll never be a bigger spot, Cam, ever. I mean, you stay here for three years. The spot's never going to be bigger than the number one team in the country on opening night in front of 11,000. Here you go, kid. You know, if he walks the first two batters, go get him. You know what I mean? If he goes and does Cam Johnson, like next thing you know, you're like, yo, we yeah, got another dude. You look up here in the fourth inning and you know, he's got like, Whoa, 10 strikeouts. So, I yeah. mean, so if he was an, like, I was just thinking this Thursday when I was watching, and again, you know, like, there, I'm sure there's a theory and a philosophy behind it that makes, you know, you explain it to me and I'm like, oh, okay, now I get it. But then to put him in in that situation, where the one thing that you're terrified of him doing. I mean, like, man, like, hey, your margin of error just went from, like, you know, here to here. So good luck. Figure it out. You know, and again, you're on the biggest stage. They got 11,000 here. Number one team in the country is feeling themselves. Sorry. You know, it was like, man, if, if this kid's a dude, start him. And if he's not, you know, he goes out there and he walks the first three, you're like, all right, go get him. You know, Yeski, go, you know, get Coleman up. But if he's like Lloyd said, you know, you look up and you're in the fourth and you're like, this cat's throwing. Don't tell. No, nobody talk to him. Yeah, nobody say a word to him. Yeah. I mean, maybe he, th- he still thinks he's in high school. But you were able to, even in that spot where he, he walked in a walked in a run and walked the bases loaded, then walked in a run. But he did throw a 3-2 slider that was out of, <sighs> like, <gasps> from just the filthiest it, planet. Oh, it oh, 78 miles it, an hour. He's pumping 95 and he goes 78 on your head and it just looked like, okay. Yeah, there and it so is. for him to be in that spot and be able to get out of it relatively unscathed, I know it's not what people want to hear because you gave up a run, and it made you know made the comeback that much harder, and you weren't able to pull it off. But it was a bright spot, a glimmer yeah. of hope to yeah. see from Cam Johnson because I think you'll start to see him utilized more agree. and more. Which that's what you're they're struggling at the moment, and um, you hope it gets better. 
I mean, you got people on Tiger Droppings that are up at three thirty in the morning breaking down Bapit. Hell yeah! Which is hell what yeah, is that? man. Hell oh, yeah! The what Bapit is. What is that? It is luck, in a sense. Acronym for Bapit. Bapit. Baseball formula. Bapit is. Oh God. <laughs> Let me see. What does Bapit measure? Bapit, a measure of a player's batting average exclusively on balls hit into the field of play. Removing outcomes not affected by the opposing defense. Home run strikeouts, for example. Hitter goes two for five with a home run and a strikeout would have a three thirty three Bapit. He's one for three on the balls he put in play. So it's basically luck. Ball, it's batting average on balls in play. Bapit. So it's it it determines like how lucky you are. Like seeing eye singles, Texas Baseball. League singles, those are Bapit hits. LSU is uh, in conference. I think they're the opposing team has like a 400 Bapit on LSU. So Bapit. that's when things really aren't going your way. Um, Stat of the day. Bapit. Wow. Have a great day, especially to the Bapit crowd on Tiger Dogs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, agree. like if you're, you're like, if you are in that demographic, it might be Jay Johnson. You are low <laughs> expected to be. Yes. Uh, but what a Jeez. low day for you right now. Try to find it. Yeah, here I mean, it is. There's no highlights. Man, look goat from at breaking three, down Bapit. 322 AM. Posting it because kind of, somebody responds at three thirty. Kind of a weird thing to deep dive and post at three a.m. Like, well, you're responding to it at three a.m. Yeah, right. <laughs> We're all here, so you're thinking about it too. Yeah, I've been looking for Bapit. Uh, like, share, comment, subscribe. We appreciate you being here. We'll be back with you tomorrow morning. Bapit. Get something weirder shit Bapit. at three a.m. <laughs>